Good afternoon and welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, April 6th, 2023. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting in our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, and it is open to the public. Uh, Trustee Hunt, do we have any cards submitted with requests from the public? Thank you, sir. No, we do not. For closed session items only. Uh, so thank you. And, and we will now adjourn to closed session and return at 530. Uh, meet Meeting is adjourned at 4 p.m.
Good afternoon and welcome to the RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, April 6th, 2023. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website at riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. A limited overflow meeting room with a television monitor will be available if the bo main boardroom meets capacity. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD board meeting YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the board, please see a staff member at the entrance and they'll be happy to assist you. I'd like to report that the board uh, uh, did not take any action during closed session. Uh, now, at this time, our Pledge of Allegiance will be provided by video and will feature Alyssa Pires, who is a sixth grade student from Longfellow Elementary School. Hello. My name is Alyssa Pierce and I'm a sixth grade student here at Longfellow Elementary School in the DLI program. My incredible teacher is Ms. Hernandez and my fantastic principal is Mrs. Koss. I am here to do the Pledge of Allegiance, so please stand. Place the flag and put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may now be seated. <clears throat> Thank you to Alyssa for doing a great job with the pledge. Uh, we have been fortunate to have such great students here all year providing reports about their schools. Tonight, this first group of students will be giving their final reports and then they will be recognized for their outstanding service to the board this past school year. Students were asked to respond to three questions uh, beyond the report that they typically give. What have you learned about yourself, your school, and the district as a result of serving as the student board rep? What recommendations do you have for the board to keep doing well and to improve our schools for future generations? And lastly, what are your plans for next year and your goals and aspirations for the future overall? So once all three students have completed their reports, I'll then invite Dr. Angulo, Jamie Angulo, to help us present the students with the plaques, and then we'll invite our, uh, the board to come up on the stage to take photos with them. So we will start with uh, Elizabeth Cisneros from John W. North High School. Welcome. Testing. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board, it is bitter bittersweet to say that this is the last time I will be reporting to the board on behalf of John W. North High School. As the representative to the board, I had the opportunity to learn more about my school's activities, especially those that I have not been able to join. I also had the opportunity to learn about activities occurring at other schools that I had not been aware of, such as events at Poly, Ramona, and STEM. For the district as a whole, I have been able to learn who the board members are, and um, which has been a privilege. This has also been a great opportunity for me to practice both my public speaking and leadership skills. At North, the representative to the board is also the president of the Inner Club Council. Over the past year, I have been in charge of all USL-sponsored events that recognize clubs, sports, and organizations. Some examples of, the, of these events include Fall and Spring Club Rush, uh, as well as Hussey Pride Day and Night, which I reported on on my last visit. This has helped me to learn about my school, and I was able to become aware of clubs that I never knew existed at North, as well as get to know the students in those clubs more. I've also served at the School Plus Two Coordinator with the responsibility of checking in students at events and providing incentives for involvement. We are especially proud this year of our dance and tailgate attendance, which both 
improve this last year. My recommendation for the board would be to add more diverse representation within our required leadership selections. Riverside is a very diverse community and especially coming from such a diverse school such as North, having more minority representation within the literature curriculum would be a great improvement. I believe that the board should continue to open their meetings to the public and live stream the meetings in order to ensure that the community remains aware of what is happening within the district. As of right now, my plan is to attend Cal State Fullerton with a major in political science in the hopes of gaining a minor in dance. However, my dream school is UCLA where I'm waitlisted and so I'm hoping to continue to try and achieve my goals and hopefully get off the waitlist. <laughs> After I earn my bachelor's degree in political science, I hope to attend Columbia, Columbia University Law School. Once again, it has been a privilege to report on behalf of John W. North High School alongside Isabel, Ava, and Charlene. I wish the three of you the best in your future endeavors. Thank you for your time and have a great night. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for your report. Our next uh, report is from Riverside Polytechnic High School, Isabel Urungri. Welcome. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. I'm Isabel Irungaray, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide board reports for Poly High School this school year. Serving as a student board representative has helped me to expand the passion I have for education and making a difference in the lives of students. Of course, most of us are here as representatives because we have a lot of pride in our school. I love Poly High School, and being able to share that with you has only helped to solidify my Poly pride for life. I have also learned that the high schools in our district are more similar than they are different. We are all holding dances, assemblies, organizing clubs, and doing our best to make our schools the best possible experience for all students. We are all putting effort into improving, into improving and this inspires me. I think the Riverside Unified School District does an amazing job at making people feel seen and heard while doing our best to listen to feedback and improve. Although most of us leave after reports, I have a family who actively follows and participates with the district, and I've seen change happen when change was due. For instance, in recent years, we've seen the district take action to bring special education students back to school during COVID, make DLI program improvements, and adjust grading standards. I was asked to share recommendations to the board for improving our schools for future generations, and these are my thoughts. My father has always been an excellent example for me and has taught me the need to fail because ultimately, failure is what allows us to grow and become better. This year, I read the book, The Outliers, The Story of Success, and this quote struck me. We prematurely write off people as failures. We are far too much in awe of those who succeed and far too dismissive of those who fail. And most of all, we become much too passive. We overlook just how large a role we all play, and by we, I mean society, in determining who makes it and who doesn't. It seems to me that the way our schools are structured, and not all of this can be controlled by the board since they are bound by standards, writes off kids prematurely as failures. Once kids are labeled, they give up. I believe kids who are told they are smart become smart. We have to keep telling our students that they have potential, that failing is part of life, and that continuing to work hard is key. My favorite poly teachers allow us to improve upon our work so that we truly learn. Mr. Schiller, for instance, a popular chemistry teacher, allows test corrections for half of the points back. It's not about the points, it's about having a second chance to really learn the material. Mrs. Yana, my AP language teacher, has us write four versions of the same essay with corrections. Again, this method teaches us that failing is okay. We can always improve and learn. I hope that the Board of Education can make policies and decisions that encourage this type of learning, all the way from elementary school up to high school. I've had plenty of teachers who did not follow these methods, who focus on outcomes, box students in based on performance on one test or one essay, and do not provide opportunities for growth. This is especially detrimental for kids who already struggle with self-confidence, have difficult backgrounds or home life, or don't tend to excel academically. We need school to be about learning, not about being perfect from the start. Next year, I will be a senior at Poly High School, and I look forward to serving as ASB president. I plan to continue swimming, playing water polo, and being an active member of Bear Pals. I wish to work towards creating a culture of inclusivity and service through my connections with others. 
Polly feels like home, and I am grateful for the people I've gotten to know. I cannot wait for more Friday Night Lights, balloon arches, and adventures with my favorite people. I will exude Polly pride in all that I do, and am blessed to say that I have had the best high school experience I could ask for. After high school, I wish to attend a four-year university. I have been able to work as a synchronized swimming coach and tutored young students. Although I do not have a set career path, my experiences have led me to a, path in, a passion for education, which I will continue to explore and has only grown with experiences like these. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Trustee Hunt has a comment or question. Thank you. Thank you for that very insightful and passionate speech. And I should have asked this of Elizabeth too, but tell me as a high school student, What's, what's the homework load like? That's a hard question for me. I think it just depends on the weeks. Um, I go through weeks where I have no homework. I have almost nothing to do, but then I'll have a week where I have a test in every class and I have a lot to do. Um, but for me, it's just a matter of balancing my schedule and trying to stay on top of things. I think that a lot of students who fall behind on homework aren't necessarily using their, their class time um, as well as they should be. But. Well, Isabel, you might not have a uh, career path set out yet, but I believe you've got the, the smarts and the structure to do very well whenever you do. Thank you Thank for you. serving. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Thank you. <clears throat> so our final report is from Ramona High School, Charlene Mayo-Adams. Welcome, Charlene. Good afternoon, Board President, Mr. Angulo Farouk, Superintendent, Ms. Hill, and esteemed members of the board. As I am standing here today, I'm filled with both joy and sadness. Today serves as my last day of reporting all the wonderful events at Ramona High School. Over, this, over the past several months, I have gotten used to and looked forward to displaying Ramona's achievements this year proudly. I have, re I have really realized something quite remarkable about RUSD schools. We take pride in being unique. When faced with the question, what does an RUSD student look like? There is no one answer, there are infinite. We are resilient, kind, ambitious, ambitious passionate, and eccentric. Being, such, being around such determined and unique students pass, pushes me to the, be the best version of myself. I plan to continue my education at UC Santa Cruz, go banana slugs, where I will be studying in visual communications. While in college, I hope to gain more work experience in my studies by networking, applying to internships, work study. Currently, I'm planning to enroll into FIDM, Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise, to further my passion in fashion after the four years at UC Santa Cruz. Throughout my time as Ramona's student board representative, I have learned the importance of opportunities. RUSD display, displays a variety of opportunities for its students and parents. For example, scholarships are easy to apply to, but hard to find. Ramona has made thousands of scholarships accessible to the, all students in an instant by placing all, all of the website, all of the scholarships on Ramona's websites. In my senior year, I am surrounded by students who are faced with hard decisions and challenges about their future. Most of RUSD's schools, high school's campuses offer at the AVID program to students. This program works to prepare students to take, to take on challenges about colleges, their future, and finance. Although not all students who want to go to college sign up for this program. Therefore, they face a disadvantage compared to students in these college prep programs. A great, way, a great way to defeat this disadvantage is to incorporate a college counselor or career center in all of our high school campuses. This allows for students who are not receiving these critical information about college or vocational programs to receive the support other students have access to. It was a privilege to serve as Ramona's student board representative this year. Thank you for all of, all of your support and involvement in providing opportunities for Ramona's students. Thank you. Good evening. So I'd once again like to thank and congratulate the students for a job well done in representing their school to the board. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me have a question. Go ahead, Trustee. I'd love to comment just a, a second. 
I know the the board uh, as a whole appreciates our, our student reps and and uh, and what you tell us. I, I have to say that uh, I'm probably overly critical of uh, of the things that student reps say because I've I've heard these reports for years and years and years and I, I hear about dances and activities and sports scores etc cetera, etc cetera, and it's all fine and informative but you guys uh, stand up uh, out amongst all the the reps that I've heard because when I hear about dances and those things I I'm, I'm hearing them in the context in the context of uh, student government goals uh, that each one of you uh, have have talked about what you want your student governments and what you want your school to accomplish during the year uh, and when you speak about uh, sports and when you speak about dances you, you've you always talked about the broader goals and uh, and that's very 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 helpful for uh, for for me uh, nice job and what you what you've done this year you've uh, you've taught me a lot and I think you've set uh, a standard for future board reps that that, uh, that that's very positive so nice nice job thank you trustee can you please proceed dr. Oh, no yes so thank you I could care with what he just said and so congratulations and thank you for representing your school so very well this year so I would like to bring you up and give you a plaque as our appreciation and then I would like to invite them to go to the stage to take a picture with the board if that's okay so Charlene Uh, Isabel and Elizabeth and then you're gonna go around and go to the board so I'd like to invite him to the stage
So I just want to express my appreciation and gratitude again to all of the student board representatives. Uh, and you know, as always, you're always welcome to attend. It's a public meeting, but uh, feel free to, to you know, do whatever you need to do. So thank you again for all of your service. And we're looking forward to following all of your great success beyond RUSD. Thank you so much. So our next uh, section of our agenda is our district group reports. And our first group uh, report will be provided by Ms. Anai Chang, the president of the California School Employees Association. Welcome, Anai. Yeah, All righty. Good evening, Superintendent Renee Hill, uh, President Angela Farouk, uh, distinguished board members, and everyone here tonight. Since February, Chapter 506 has nominated and elected a new team for negotiations. I'm happy to announce that our team will only change by one person this year. Okay. Second, our communications officer, Ojan Sykes, continues to have monthly chapter newsletters for our members with plenty of resources from contract, constitution, and benefits. Let's see. Next, our first vice president, Marcy Frias, is excited to be working on our chapter's 2023 college scholarship applications with a deadline of April 30th. We will be giving out three $500 scholarships. Please call the CSEA office for more information. Equally important, virtual health and welfare meetings will be on April 16th and will be reported out at our next chapter meeting on April 19th. Further, Second Vice President Ninfa Gonzalez has been tasked with consolidating the school site's reps, rep list with verifying if the site representatives are still at the same sites and recruiting new site reps where needed. In addition, on March 13th, Third Vice President Mr. Mark Adame attended the Inland Empire Labor Council meeting and did, not, and did report out information to our chapter. Further, on April, uh, this Saturday, April 1st, 2023, CSEA held a pre-retirement seminar at Grant Education Center. If you were not able to attend uh, and make this one, CSEA will also be holding a CalPERS retirement, a uh, pre-retirement webinar on April 25th. And please call the CSEA office for more information. I do need to report an ongoing interference from a particular administrator in a particular department. I am again here informally informing you that this is an unfair labor practice. This shows a continuing pattern from this department and is unacceptable. Lastly, on an exciting note, we are still looking forward to RUSD providing the previous teacher computers to our classified employees. This grand gesture in the name of equity is greatly appreciated and will in addition to their normal work duties, allow all classified employees to participate in those all important online employee surveys. Thank you, and this concludes my report from CSEA Chapter 506. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that report, Ani, and we'll make sure our administration follows up with you. Trustee Hunt has a comment or question. Thank hey, you. Mr. Hunt. <laughs> hey, Ms. Chang, how are you doing, President? Uh, doing well, we used you. to get, I know I used to get, and I'm sure my colleagues wouldn't second what I'm about to say. We used to get your newsletter. Can you talk with your, your folks and make sure we're back on that mailing list or you can just send them to Ms. Martin and she can put them in our packets and that sort of thing? Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Furrier. Thank you for seeing Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Our, our next group report is Ms. Laura Bowling, president of the Riverside City Teachers Association. Welcome, Ms. Bowling. Good evening, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and Board members. I would like to start off by extending an invitation to the Board, Cabinet, and RCTA educators to attend the RCTA Celebration for California Day of the Teacher. Our celebration will take place at the Citrus Heritage Park on Wednesday, May 10th at 4 p.m. Ms. Martin has all the information. We have spent the last month meeting with specialized special ed groups, elementary, RSP, SDC, speech and language pathologists, to name a few. 
The resounding sentiment is that these educators need more time to do their job. I believe that there have been attempts to aid these educators, but we are not meeting their needs. Our conversations have been robust and include a wide range of topics, but in multiple conversations across multiple disciplines, there was one resounding idea that members keep coming back to is time. Spend a day with an educator, but I wanna focus on SPED educators and we'll see the many facets of their job. Testing, scheduling, organizing, inviting, teaching, changing diapers, containing, contacting parents, collaborating with general ed teachers, writing IEPs, holding IEPs, logging interventions, and min minutes spent with students. SPED educators regularly give up their preparation to periods to hold meetings. It's something the seven days that the district gives us mitigates, but it doesn't make up for all the prep missed and caseload management time. This is just a small part of what they do daily. I continue to be amazed in the conversations I have had pa this past month of what they accomplished during the day and then go home and spend the several more hours just to get ready for the next day. This, of course, is the case with all educators. RCTA continues to work diligently with the district to bring an opportunity for SPED educators to get help with their very important role in our district and, more importantly, with our USD students. Additionally, RCTA is currently working on distributing funds to educators that apply for the Barbara Kerr Grant. The RCTA Scholarship Committee is waiting for the deadline for our USD seniors to apply for scholarships for ne their next steps in their education. Lastly, we would like to congratulate the RCTA educators that are Teachers of the Year for 2023, Carrie Valenzuela, Sarah Renoke, and Andrea Graydon. Well deserved. Thank you for a good meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you for that report, Ms. Bowen. <coughs> Our next uh, agenda item is our superintendent comments, so I'll turn it over to Superintendent Hill. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. <clears throat> Since we last met, I've had the opportunity to visit Pachapa and Monroe Elementaries. Uh, saw outstanding examples of students collaborating to solve difficult uh, math problems especially. Um, their level of collaboration was great, and I saw a lot of evidence of our phonics-based phonics reading program implemented very well. Uh, last week, um, Laura just mentioned, I had an interesting book ending week. One was to congratulate teachers of the year, uh, two who I've known for 20 or 25 years, uh, one teacher who was new to me. So I saw the teachers with all that experience being congratulated and on Saturday, we had a recruitment event that drew 600 candidates. So seeing fresh, brand new, uh, people coming in through the classroom who haven't been there. It was a great contrast for the week. Um, and our, our students and families uh, continue to uh, do all the year-end events, uh, which is quite a, a pleasure to um, participate in. Before I conclude my report, I'd like to invite our community to the You Are Enough community event on Saturday, April 22nd from 9 to noon at Poly High. If you'll see more information on the website or social media, and I will see you there. Thank you for that report, Superintendent Hill. At this time, members of the public may provide comments on any items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. The board is limited to responses that they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet they are permitted to ask clarifying questions as to a presenter's public comments. Also, I would like to note that public comments that are submitted via the electronic communication submission form are attached to the board agenda 24 hours prior to the meeting. But we did, did, we did have comments submitted, right? Mm -hmm. We did have. Um, it, it, They're it's, attached to the agenda now. Right. I, I'm only saying because it's yeah. re reference. Of, I'll now uh, have asked our board clerk, Trustee Hunt, who has shared with me the comment cards that have been submitted uh, with requests from members of the public. And uh, we, we have nine comments. <coughs> and so <coughs> our first uh, public comment is from Dave Everett, followed by Jennifer Morris, followed by Alicia Ricks. Welcome, Mr. Everett. Thank you. You have three um, minutes. I wanted to talk a minute for about the uh, so-called community benefits agreement that was passed last week. Um, I'm with the Western Electrical Contractors Association, and I just wanted to remind this board that 
under the deal you passed last week or you started negotiations on last week, no union, no non-union apprentice uh, can work on these jobs, even the ones that live and work and go to school right here in Riverside. Secondly, um, I brought up the issue of S Senate Bill 1439. It wasn't mentioned in the minutes and it wasn't addressed at all. It basically says, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've taken a contribution from somebody who is, uh, has business before the board, then you can't vote on those items. Uh, Trustee Farouk took $1,500 from the laborers pack on November 15th, 2002, or 2022. And uh, the laborers international pack gave him $1,500 on October 21st, 2022. And so uh, according to my math, uh, he wouldn't be able to vote until November 15th, 2023 uh, on this discriminatory special interest deal. Uh, last but certainly not least, and I think this is the most important thing that was also not mentioned in the minutes, according to the National Black Chamber of Commerce, 98% of minority contractors are non-union. So this PLA will discriminate against black and Latino contractors in a district that's over 76% minority. Across the nation, members of the minority community have publicly opposed PLAs. Claims that, uh, this is a quote from the uh, CEO of the National Black Chamber of Commerce, Harry Alford, claims that a PLA could be a tool to ensure minority construction workers and businesses are used on a public project is a farce. Government mandated PLAs are opposed by the National Black Chamber of Commerce because almost all minority owned contracting firms are not affiliated with unions. African American owned contracting firms are tip typically small businesses and employ their own core workforce and skilled constru construction workers who are not unionized and are generally more diverse than the construction workers coming from union hiring halls. Uh, a lot of talk tonight about uh, diversity uh, and then, you know, a, a four to one vote uh, against diversity last week. And, and I'd like to thank Trustee Lee for being the only person to stand up against this kind of discrimination and be the only person to uh, vote for uh, every, everybody who is an apprentice or everyone who uh, is a minority contractor in Riverside to be able to vote on these projects, I mean, to work on these projects. Um, and I'd end by just uh, re reading the end of this, uh, uh, the Black Chamber of Commerce um, CEO's quote, 98% of black and Hispanic construction companies are non-union shops. Thus, a project labor agreement or a community benefits agreement, it's the same thing, greatly limit the opportunity for black and Hispanic firms. The possibility of black and Hispanic labor is greatly suppressed. It is beyond disappointing when we see diversity clauses added to legislation that is fundamentally harmful to minority communities. I think when you guys do an audit of the PLA, you will see that. Thank you for your comments. Our next co comments are from Jennifer Morris, followed by Alicia Ricks, followed by Matt Jude. Welcome, Jennifer, you have three minutes. Hi, um, I'd like to speak on the importance of AIDS in your special education program. It's because of these AIDS that my son has been able to participate in a lot of extracurricular activities. When he went to prom, the AIDS were there dressed in their formal wear to make sure he was safe and had a good time. When, we went, when he went to Knott's Berry Farm for a senior day, the AIDS were there riding Ghost Rider with him to make sure he was safe and had a good time. When he was in elementary school, he had, was able to attend the Hearts program. Uh, that was because the aides were there. The aides were there to make sure he was safe and had a good time. When he was in middle school, he was able to attend the prime time after school program. The aides were there to make sure he was safe and had a good time. These aides are important and vital. You must find a way to help retain them. Instructional aides is a classified part-time job. Without it being a full-time job, it will continue to have a high turnover. Groundskeepers are classified as full-time. They're important, but not more important than an instructional aide. Campus supervisors are classified as full-time. They are also important, but not more so than aides. These are just two examples of current job openings with RUSD. Uh, RUSD has a special education aid retention problem, and the ones who suffer are the students and the teachers they support. I also want to say, I want to thank the board for those of you that uh, attended the special education spring fling. The kids loved having you there. And I want to thank you for your support of the special education program. I've been speaking in front of this board for about five years, and the board has always taken it to their heart. 
are issues that we've brought here. I feel that we have been listened to. I feel that your heart is with our special education students. And I want to thank you for that. I'm going to continue to speak because my son is going to be continuing on. He's graduating this year. Um, and while I'm here, and I'm lucky enough, I want to say thank you to Lisa Murta, who is my child's teacher. She's back there. She is the reason that he goes to school every day. His heart, he loves her. And she has taken him into her heart. And I'm a little emotional because she, she has made a difference. She saw my son's abilities. All the teachers have always seen my son's ability, but she, he loves her. And I want to thank Mr. Hansen for all of his support that he has given our special education students. So this is just a, a, a speech of thankfulness. But please remember the aides. We need more retention of the aides. They're very important. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next public comment is Alicia Ricks, followed by Matt Jude, followed by Chris Vogt. Welcome, Alicia. You have three minutes. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Hill, President Farouk, and board members. At this time, I would like to express my gratitude to you and to also recognize Mr. Hansen for all he does uh, for Polly. He is consistently at functions on campus and off campus. He also comes to our monthly CAC meetings, which he allowed us to hold at Polly um, to show his support. And Mr. Hansen has always had time for me and the issues I bring to his attention. And I'm pretty sure he's glad that Mikey's last year at Polly is this year because <laughs> um, I'm calling him a lot. Uh, now on to special education. We need more aides, um, kind of piggybacking off of Ms. Morris, um, and we need more one-on-one -on -one aides. This is a district issue, not just a poly issue. You have aides quitting and you're not hiring. You have students that need one-on-one -on -one aides and they're not being provided, or if they are being provided, it's because they have been taken away for another student that needs a one-on-one -on -one aide. Um, this problem isn't being solved, it's being neglected. Mikey has two general ed classes and there have been multiple times where he has been unable to attend because of the shortage. Without that support that is needed for him and other mods of your students to be able to attend their gen ed classes that is in their IEP, it is, that is necessary for true inclusion to occur. We also go on outings to work on life skills and job skills and that has also been interrupted. We all know aides need to get paid more. That's known throughout the district. Um, and I do know that they did recently receive some raises, so thank you. Um, RS, RUSD offers mainly part-time positions for aides four or six hours. With the lack of pay and hours, it is no wonder we are having the issues we do, and unfortunately, it is at the cost of the students. Your students are suffering along with the limited staff that you do have. You have aides that are quitting or calling out, and that creates more work for the team that is there. Who wants to work like that? Um, that is not a message that we really want to send to our educators, our parents, because as you know, I'm the president for the CAC, so I get messaged a lot in regards to the aid issue. Um, COVID is over, so we can't use COVID as excuse. Um, the unemployment has run out, so people need jobs. Um, if you are taking into consideration every child's IEP and what they need, you would see that there is a lack of aids and a lack of one-on-ones. Without a one-on-one -on -one aid, um, like my son has epilepsy, so without the, the support of that one-on-one -on -one aid, um, he wouldn't be able to go to school. So um, it's a simple fix. You either pay more or offer more hours, but if you can do both, that would be great. Um, as I brought up at the last meeting, I attended all of the resources and tools given to general ed to succeed, which is quite amazing. And here is special ed not even getting the bare minimum. And by bare minimum, I just mean staffing. Um, we need to do better for our kids, our teachers, our current aides, and our program specialists. I can only imagine how discouraging it is for them to know the need of these students and nothing being done. Also, I am suggesting promoting hearts and prime time to our families with disabilities. It is talked about during IEPs, but our parents need to feel more comfortable and confident that this program includes them. These are programs are for elementary and junior high, but there is a definite need for kids with disabilities during high school because even though they're of age to take care of themselves, they cannot. So if we can look at maybe getting an Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Our next speakers are Matt Jude, followed by Chris Vogt, followed by Laura Vogt. Is Matt here? Oh, thank you. Welcome, welcome Matt. You have three minutes. Okay. All right. Good evening, Superintendent Hill, board members, staff members, fellow community members. 
I'd like to express my concerns about recent bullying fights at Martin Luther King High. Um, this was discussed recently in a local Facebook group. Um, my son also attends there and, and lets me know some of the things that are going on at King High School. Uh, basically, I was thinking most of the day about the right way to put this, uh, to put forth my thoughts, especially on such a sensitive subject matter. Uh, but it comes down to this. In my opinion, everybody has the right to self-identify, um, as one of the subjects um, does in the, um, that was involved in the fight. Um, they're, enjoy, they're able to enjoy life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, just like everyone else. But as soon as that person, or anyone else for that matter, interferes with another person's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, then something needs to be done. In a circulating video, we have a person described as transgender violently pushing a girl up against the table. The girl was doing as best as she could, facing somebody that was much larger than she was. She was basically looking up at this person here as she's getting pushed up against the table. Thankfully, another person intervened prior to the supervisors arriving to break up the fight since it's pretty obvious somebody could have been hurt or killed in this lopsided altercation. What is our USD doing to prevent these situations? In fairness, we all know there's three sides to every situation. What party one said, what party two said, and what really happened. Are the administrators, are the administrators addressing the actions of all parties? Describing this fight as mutual combat doesn't cut it when one person is way bigger than the other person. My trust in RUSD handling these types of situations is low, mainly due to the reputation that RUSD has of sweeping issues underneath the rug. But RUSD needs to step it up in this situation and other bullying incidents and take measures to reduce the bullying in our schools before someone suffers life-altering injuries or even dies. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Our next speakers are Chris Vogt, followed by Laura Vogt, followed by Monique Edwards. Welcome, Chris. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Honorable President, members of the board. I'm here for very much the same reason, but it's more district-wide, actually within that area of King High School. Uh, it came to our attention the other day that a student uh, at uh, Twain Elementary has been uh, bullying, threatening with physical harm, uh, guns, and so forth, uh, the other students. Nothing has happened. Now, I can say nothing has happened because I haven't heard anything. But I want to make you all aware. It's all out there in social media. And you've got a lot of very upset parents. If something is happening, we understand laws. You can't name names or say stories. But you've got to get information out there to the parents that this has occurred and this is what we have done. Because that's not happening. And parents are getting very upset. Uh, we have an issue, and Matt spoke about it. Many cases uh, we've experienced, we have a lot of kids, we've uh, enjoyed Twain, uh, Miller, and King. I think they're fantastic schools. I'm from Pittsburgh. The schools weren't as, as good as those. I, I'm very impressed. However, bullies continue to be protected, while the bullying kids are continued to be persecuted. I had a student that uh, in um, uh, the middle school that was getting bullied for years. We talked to the vice president. We talked to, to the, uh, the principal, vice president and principal. And uh, finally, our little guy, he was small for his age, had it, wasn't being protected. It took two years. He turned around and he laid into the other kid. We got a call from the vice principal saying, sorry, your kid's going to be suspended for a day. I said, good for our kid. He protected himself. By the way, the bully stopped. The uh, resources officer from police said, next time that happens, you did the right thing. If you get suspended, I'll take you out for ice cream. Because they're not being protected. Um, I have a, uh, another student in elementary who got pushed, 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 beat on, punched. He's a big kid. He's strong. We told him, don't tell the supervisors. Nothing happened. He turned around and popped a kid, and he got suspended for a day. I asked to see the policy, the written policy. The school didn't have one. We can use our own discretion. This was at the, uh, the elementary, and it was also at the high school. Our one kid who got bullied in middle school was bullied his entire career in the school system, and he finally, the kid dumped milk on him and pushed him. He pushed the kid back. The vice principal went to suspend him for a week. I said, no, appeal. He got to serve his sentence, then, then he can appeal. 
they don't have Thank a public you. policy. Thank you, Chris, for your, your comments. Our administration will follow up with you. Laura, vote followed by Monique Edwards, followed by Lori Lopez. I'm just going to finish that. We appealed and we won. Okay. You tell us, see something, say something. But when we do, nothing is done. I brought a concern to the principal, Mr. McCombs, at Mark Twain Elementary two months ago that a student in my son's class has mentioned numerous times that he wants to kill himself. Yet my son comes home telling me how bad he feels that this student keeps telling him his suicidal thoughts all the time. Why does my 11-year-old child have to be the one telling this child how his life is worth living? Why is this student seemingly not getting help? And now I hear on social media about a third grade student who has threatened not once but twice to bring a gun to school, that he has threatened another child with a knife, that this child has been violent and threatening for years and yet still in this school. This brings me to the child who threatened his teacher. That same teacher brought her concerns to the school and district and yet that student still brought a gun to school and shot this teacher. Don't let us be that school. Don't let us be that district that did nothing. My daughter is a fourth grade teacher at another district. It broke my heart when she explained her active shooter training and she told me, mom, I have body bags in my classroom. I'm training to decide which student I help and which I leave to die. This needs to stop. As parents, we deserve to be informed of all threats made to our children's school by the school, not on social media. Do better, please. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Volk. Our administration will follow up with you. Our next speakers are Monique Edwards, followed by Lori Lopez, followed by Sandy R. Welcome, Monique. You have three minutes. Hi. Thank you. Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and board members. Thank you for this public forum. I'm coming today as a parent of a second, fifth, and eighth grader here at RUSD. I'm also a child advocate in profession, a concerned parent and community member. As you've heard this week via social media, there was a discussion about a child engaging in threats here at Mark Twain Elementary. I went directly to the principal via email and did CC Dr. Hill and stated that a threat assessment was completed. The principal wrote back that next day, this threat assessment was completed and the child would be suspended for the maximum sentence. Unfortunately, this child has been having disciplinary concerns since kindergarten. My child is below the grade level of that child and I still know who the child is. I am concerned about the safety of my children, all children, and of all the educators. In fact, according to educationweek.org, there have been 13 shootings on school property within this four months of this year alone. This does not include physical altercations or violence with other weapons. In reviewing the RUSD Threat Assessment Manual, unfortunately online I only found a July 2016 version. In reviewing it, it states that the philosophy of goals should have parent involvement strategies to help ensure parental support and reinforcement of rules within the guidelines of the school. However, the policy does not discuss when other parents are notified of high-risk assessment based on Appendix B of the manual. I am pleading with the board to review the threat assessment manual and incorporate notifications of community and parents. Also, it is my hope that we can work in conjunction to create a safe environment as well as support the child that clearly needs our help from the district and the community. However, after years of concern and now gun violence threats, traditional schooling may not be the route that is best for this child. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Our Last three speakers are Lori Lopez, followed by Sandy R, followed by Patricia E. Welcome, Lori, you have three minutes. Hi, Hi. good evening. Um, I wanted to, I actually have two things to address. The first thing that I wanna address is the uniform complaint procedure form. Unfortunately, my daughter was the victim of some pretty heinous sexual harassment at King High School. Um, 
I reported it to the appropriate people, I filled out the appropriate document, and I followed the policy, which states I'm to fax that form to the number on the form, which I did. I called later that same day to make sure that the form had been received, and I was instructed or told by, um, I believe he's in charge of complaints with the district, that um, he has no idea where those faxes go. There's only one fax machine in the building. He thinks it's on the third floor, but he has no idea. And the concern that I have with that is you have people writing confidential sexual information, could be against a staff member, could be against a student, and who knows who's getting that paperwork. Um, this was six weeks ago. Um, I did suggest to, um, I believe his name was Mr. Marshall, that that fax number needs to be removed from that form or there needs to be a secure fax to fax these things to. The number's still on the form. So that's my first issue. The second issue I have, um, again, is about safety. I came and spoke here in June um, last year about safety on school campuses and the concerns that I had and what I see in a hospital emergency room that sees a lot of kids that have been injured in fights at school. And <clears throat> this particular incident that happened at King um, is very bothersome because it's a biological male against a, a female. Um, but further than that, I firmly believe that each one of you has a stake in safety and that educating our kids and keeping our kids safe are the top priorities. I know um, because I do uh, research and read about state government, I follow the education committee in the state, I follow lots of things, and you are handcuffed to some extent with discipline. But I would suggest a working group of parents teachers, because let me tell you, the teachers that I've talked to at King are absolutely disgusted with the behavior of students and the discipline, because there is none. Um, so a working group to talk about this issue specifically, because it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. We have a crisis, and I don't think our USD wants to be in the same situation Moreno Valley is with a lawsuit because a child died on their campus. Um, that family complained and complained and complained about his safety and they were ignored. So you guys do better. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Our last two speakers are Sandy R. followed by Patricia E. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. Thank you. So King High School, the fight is all over social media, biological male who identifies as a female fighting with a biological female. The parents who are familiar with the situation stated that the male has been using the girls' restrooms and locker rooms that your policy 5145.3 allows. I have spoken against this policy many times because I do not feel that it protects female students. This district prioritizes a man's feelings over a woman's safety, and that is misogyny defined. Many parents mentioned that you are aware of the situation involving the students because this isn't his first fight against female students. You can't claim that there is no difference between males and females since you differentiate them in PE class. Um, you score them differently based on biological sex when it comes to running a mile, push-ups, and pull-ups. Your policies are very inconsistent. Most national sports organizations are walking back from allowing athletes to compete outside of their biological sex category and restoring Title IX protections. This district should lend their voice to writing a resolution regarding doing the same. Next, let's talk about Mark Twain. Elementary, parents have serious concerns about a third grade student making threats of bringing a weapon to school. He has made these threats on multiple occasions and they also state that he's bullying other students. Have you watched the news about the Virginia kindergartner who shot his teacher? She's now suing her district for $40 million due to their failure in handling a situation just like this one. I've read your policy. If he was a fourth grader, you would have more discipline options. I think this is another policy that you should consider revising, but I'm sure that you will just state that it's another policy handed down to you by the state. These are the kind of policies that don't make sense. You need to lend your voice to improve policies like this. They should not be a one-size-fits-all. If this district truly stands with parents and acknowledges that parents have the ultimate authority 
authority over their children's upbringing, as has consistently been upheld by the courts, then lend your voice to AB 1314. This bill would provide that a parent or guardian has the right to be notified in writing within three days from the date that any teacher, counselor, or employee of the school becomes aware that a pupil is identifying at the school as a gender that does not align with the child's sex on their birth certificate or is using sex segregated school programs or activities, including athletic teams, competitions, or using facilities that do not align with the child's sex on their birth certificate. Last meeting, you stated, Mr. Hunt, that I believe that there was a cabal of ill-intentioned teachers, which is not true. However, by keeping secrets from parents, it seems that this board thinks there is a cabal of ill-intentioned parents. Most parents love their children and would do anything for them. I'm not blind to the fact that some children do not have a good home life, but you can't lump all parents as abusers any more than I can lump all of you as groomers. I hope that you realize that the more this district tries to come between parents and students, the more kids you're going to. Thank you, Ms. R. Our final public comment is from Patricia E. Welcome, Ms. E. You have three minutes. Okay, good evening. I hate the public speaking so much. I just have a couple of thoughts. Um, I did notice when I'm, when I'm not here, I do watch from home when I can. And I notice there's a difference in the room when certain groups come and they're angered and they, they chant and they yell. They're never called out and told, show some decorum or anything like that. But when parents are upset about masks or things that matter to us, I just think that we shouldn't be held to a different standard. That if you're going to um, chastise one group, then you should chastise all or let everybody just feel the way they feel about a certain topic and just take it. Um, second thing, we definitely have, you've been listening to all the fights that are going on. Arlington, my kids tell me every day there's a fight or two. Last week there was a fight during a promposal. You just don't know where to look when you're out in the courtyard anymore. But you could build as many wellness centers as you want. There could be one in every area of the school. It's not going to be addressed. Um, these kids need help and it's not working, whatever, whatever's happening. They need to just focus on school and the grades. And then going on to now the grades. Um, if I looked at Aries every day, my kids would be punished and they would be losing everything that they have. Because every time they come home and I say, what's going on to my normally A's and B's students, I'm seeing a D in math, what's happening? I'm getting concerned, mom. Nothing's been entered. All my grades, they haven't been entered yet. We can't, like, you want us to be involved and stay on top of it, but, and, and I know the teachers have lives outside of school, but so do the students. But they're held to a standard where they still need to produce the work, even though they may have a job or homework or projects going on. So I just think there needs to be some type of a deadline because I think entering grades at the end of a quarter is not appropriate. A kid should know how they're doing. They should be able to look at it and feel good like, oh, I just saw my grade go up, but they can't because the grades are not being entered until sometimes the very end. 28 seconds left on this very holy week. I'm going to end with these famous last words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Thank you, Ms. E. That concludes our pub public input. I will now turn to board member comments, and we'll start with our student board member. Oh, there it is. Hello. I'm so happy to be here. It's nice seeing so many faces and hearing so many comments. On a bright note, as many seniors have already experienced, a lot of college letters have come in. I'm very excited to announce that I'm committing to UC Berkeley under a political science major. And <laughs> really, I could not have done it without the teachers at Ramona, without the AVID department at Ramona, especially as a first-generation student. And so I'd like to give thanks. 
Although the student representatives are no longer here, if they are watching this, any of them, I do have something to say. Student representatives, the work you're doing is impressive. You stand here and you give reports to some of the highest people in our district. Your passion, you speak with eloquence and you speak with passion. Know that what you're doing is important. You are USD. You are the voices of, the, of your schools and you have a vital job of advocacy and representation. If anyone has the ability to make change, it is you. Thank you for all of your work. Another comment that I'd like to address is actually the situation at MLK. And so I am now going to shed some light on the recent situation that has happened within our district. I first wanna start off by saying that regardless of what the fight was about, a lot of students consider school to be their safe, safe place. And for one to feel the urge or need to commit an act of violence is extremely unfortunate, it is extremely heartbreaking, and it's hard to hear. No one should ever have to feel that way in any environment, especially at school. For those of you who are unaware, there was a fight that broke out between a student, however, that was already covered. We see in the fight a student who is transgender, a transgender girl, and two other girls who proceed to engage into a fight. Now, I have, excuse me, some of the comments that I've seen since the fight has become so pub publicized are extremely unsettling, and many consisted of parents dehumanizing and invalidating the girl who is transgender, refusing to respect her identity, refusing to acknowledge her as a woman, and refusing to see that at one point during the fight, two girls themselves were on her. I have heard many comments and many thoughts, and what I wanna say is this. I urge students, and especially parents, not to allow this situation to shape your views on an entire group of people at once. I also encourage parents to embrace the different types of people in our schools rather than invalidate them. As one of our representatives said, our USD looks like no specific person. There's, it's so diverse, and every child needs a support system. Every child needs to be respected, and every child needs to be loved. Every child has to be tolerated. This being said, the situation is not the first time something like this has happened. At my own personal school, we have seen students who are transgender and or LGBTQ be harassed, again invalidated, misgendered, and bullied. And today I wanna be the voice of these students. And what I do know is that students need more support systems and resources and you, um, excuse me, when it comes to their identity. And the last thing that I want is for a fight to hinder our ability to make progress. I hear a lot of parents concerned about gender neutral bathrooms, about sports, and I just want you to know that the students that I'm with every day and the students that reach out to me from other schools need this option especially those who identify as neither man nor woman. They need a place where they can feel safe and not be harassed in a place of privacy. I'd also like to say that I'm more concerned of finding the root of the problem rather than analyzing a fight. I would like to see why the girls fought. But more importantly, I want to say that I am a woman. I go to a school in RUSD and I acknowledge that there is nothing that a transgender woman can do that a cis woman cannot, fight or no fight. And I want to emphasize that the girl who is transgender is a woman, and that is all she'll ever be. So please be open and embrace our children in RISD. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Briscoe, uh, for your very important voice uh, and for speaking for the perspectives of students. We really appreciate your thoughtful comments. Thank you for that. Uh, our next uh, representative uh, we'll hear from is Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Lauren, for, um, for your courage and saying what you said today. I also want to just uh, address um, all parents, certainly parents at Miller, King, um, Twain, our, our um, the safety of our children is of paramount. And I just wanna say that just because you haven't heard exactly what 
has been done doesn't mean that nothing has been done. Um, you have our word, you certainly have my word, that something has been done. And the safety of our children is of the utmost priority. Let's work together. Let's uh, solve this problem of the angst that our children are feeling. As a parent, I'm just as scared as you when I drop off my kids. As a parent, I realize I have a great responsibility in how I'm raising my kids too. And between the two of us, we, we, we have to come together to show a better way for our children. I join you in that, in prioritizing the safety and also taking personal responsibility and the human that I'm sending out of my home every day. Um, and I just wanted to, to, to say that off the cuff. I also want to just give my uh, report for the week, the last couple of weeks. Um, I've had the privilege to support some several real, uh, wonderful programs, only a few that I'll mention here. Um, I got to support Inspire Her Mind uh, Leadership Symposium of 10th grade girls at the Bournes Technology Center. Um, I got to attend uh, some parent groups, La Comunidad, Comunidad and DLAC. And I got to attend the Riverside Council PTA Annual Awards, where uh, we got to honor um, our selfless and priceless parent volunteers. They were honored for their dedication to the students and to the school sites. And so we are very, very grateful to parents um, for the PTAs and for being really the, um, the heart of our, of our schools. Um, I got to welcome the Youth Empowerment Day Position to Rise Conference on Financial Literacy. It was an absolute excellent conference. Um, please keep a, uh, an eye out for it. Next time it comes around, I'll be sending my kids to that as well. Also um, held at the Bournes Technology Center. So now I just want to thank the Bournes Technology Center for being so um, open to us and allowing our students to um, go onto their campus. Um, and I just want to close with the last few minutes of my time um, of my time, I want to dedicate um, the rest of my public uh, comment time in memory um, of one of our beloved students, Chase Jarvis, who attended Rivera and Earhart and King High School. He was a little boy with a big heart and a sweet smile, and his parents called him their gift from God. To honor Chase's memory, um, his family is educating us all on the illness of depression and the importance to seek help early for our teens. They want to share his story and to raise the awareness for the importance of mental health in teenagers. They have created the Chase Wayne Jarvis Memorial Scholarship in order to raise money for the Kindness and Compassion Award. This is an award for students who have shown great kindness and great compassion in their communities. The first scholarship will be awarded to students from King High School, class of 2026, Chase's graduating class. For more information, please go to GoFundMe Chase Jarvis Memorial Scholarship uh, to support the family and um, stay tuned for uh, nominations if you want to nominate your student to the scholarship, the Kindness and Compassion Award. And finally, I just want to wish everyone who observes a blessed and happy Passover, a blessed and joyous Resurrection Day celebration on Sunday, and happy egg hunting to our little ones. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, Trustee Hunt. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, take them out of context I thank you for those comments about young Chase uh, I think we have to remember and I, I have suffered from depression and um, over the years and it is a real thing and um, and I've never shared it. it's something hard to share I can imagine how difficult it must have been for a young person to share that particularly in an atmosphere where so many are now judgmental and so I want to be involved in Chase's scholarship please let me know I need to be closer it, it, is our translators telling me that again I'm sorry ladies um, Sacramento the California legislature and the executive branch set and this goes to mr. Volt to some of your comments too and mrs. Volt uh, that they set California public education I know one speaker tries to throw that back because that's I say that as an excuse but it's not it's not an excuse it's the Constitution we're not legislators, they are. But for that, 
as one speaker talked about, we need to be more involved as a district uh, in what the legislation is. I have been stunned that the California Teachers Association, which is one of the most powerful groups in Sacramento as far as legislative input, et cetera, and so forth, that they have allowed, and I asked uh, President Bowling to do some research on this for me, but I want us to carry our own water too, that they have allowed uh, discipline in the classroom and on campus to be so diluted for what a school district and a teacher and a custodian, let's just say, because I talked to one today, can, can do. And uh, there are some new bills that came out, and I apologize, Dr. Farouk, I, was, I had the numbers and I didn't bring them, but I would, that are even gonna further dilute the, and water down, whatever, the, the ability for campus and classroom discipline. And it wasn't just because y'all folks are here tonight and I'm not responding to that, was, these are my notes. We've got to be involved in that. So what I'm asking, Superintendent, President, is that we, we have a group that we retain in Sacramento to watch legislation for us because our USD being in one of the largest districts in California, um, we want to be involved. I want to see a list and a briefing, if we can, public briefing, that would tell us what are the pertinent bills that are being pushed forward, particularly by the majority uh, and, the, and anyone on the Education Committee, and how those bills, if carried forth in their current condition, their current writing, would, would affect us. There are times, particularly, I believe, in classroom campus discipline, the, trying to water that down, that we, as a district and a, and a board, need to discuss that and perhaps weigh in. Write our own legislators, but write that committee. Uh, again, going back to CTA, legislators are making these rules, many of them which parents, and I don't blame you, Phil, have, have taken away their rights, uh, that they do it without parents there in the hearing rooms. They do it without teachers, apparently. They certainly do without school board members. It's, it's the uh, beltway mentality used in Washington, but it's, we know best, and they don't. These people like to my left here know best. And so I want us to really, and then I want to see that, Superintendent, I'm asking colleagues, that that be on our website, just a box they can click on pertinent current legislation in, in Sacramento you may be interested in, and even if they would like to write us, that's fine, they do, but if they want to write Senator Roth or uh, Assemblywoman uh, Sabrina Cervantes, et cetera, uh, they, can, they can do so. So I, I hope that we'll do that. Information is the best weapon against ignorance that there is, and we don't want to be as a community, certainly not as a board, ignorant. Let me say on safety, um, I asked our attorney to look into it a year or two ago, Constitutionally, the oath I took, the number one responsibility of a trustee of a public school district is safety, is campus safety. I thank my colleague, Dr. Alexander, for, uh, with the confidentiality she has to keep uh, reporting that those, prop, those items that we're all concerned about, and particularly the one at Twain, uh, are being handled, have been handled, and to the extent which can't be shared, and part of that is, well, it can't be shared, uh, is uh, extraordinary. I was, I was very impressed. Thank you, Deputy Superintendent Walker, for your leadership on that. So today, on an up note, uh, I was very pleased and, and just had a great time. I toured Lock, uh, Lake, Lake Matthews Elementary. I want to thank uh, Principal Rasputic and her staff and the teachers whose classrooms I invaded, uh, Greg the custodian who I spent time with, and very fine gentleman. And so with, along with Dr. Sosha, our assistant uh, superintendent, I, we toured. And what I saw, well, I, let me say, I went into a third grade, I went into several third grade classrooms, and they were learning algebra. And I'm so, in, for someone who never really did very well in algebra, I'm so impressed. I sat down with the little people. They were working together. They were collaborating. Uh, it was beautiful. I visited a fifth grade classroom 
and I love this, they were, and it's sort of a student-led classroom but by the teacher, and they w had gone outside and in pairs, and they had, they had measured their shadow from their feet to their head, and then they, were, they came out an hour later to see what that had changed, and uh, I had guessed wrong, I thought it would be longer, but it was shorter, and uh, so now they're going to go back in and find out the rotation of the sun and why it is. Um, and Dr. I mean, uh, Superintendent Hill, I have been bringing this up for five or six years since I saw it at Lake Elsinore's board meeting. I'm going to bring it up one more time because I've been ignored on it. But we have a communications plan, which I hope we have an update soon. But to, to, to be able to put on film for six to eight minutes, some of the things I saw today, and then to honor a teacher, the, cl the classroom of the week or whatever, and but to see and I'm sure this is the same for a 12th grade as it would be for the little ones I saw today, including kindergarten. Uh, to, to see learning happening is, Mr. Principal, is a beautiful thing. It really is. And uh, it, it was enthralling for me. And uh, I do want to say, Dr. Sosha and I both have classes with transitional lens. They get dark. So we, you know, each classroom we came in, they were busy. And so we came in, and my, my glasses are dark, and I've got on a suit, and Dr. Social's got on a suit, so we're standing there like this. And this little, this little boy stood up, and he goes, hey, are you guys from the government? And uh, I said, well, son, we, we kind of are, but n not that. But uh, very, very, very sharp uh, young people. Um, and I have a handout just to give to my board members, not of advocacy or anything. It's an NPR story that I came across something that is beginning to filter more and more down to the K-12 level, but it's about grading. And uh, this is about colleges, Dr. Alexander. This is about universities' debates about grading. And I just think it's very interesting. And I guess I should have asked I, if Beth would put it on my website or something that if someone wants to look at it. But schools like Texas, University of Texas, Notre Dame, University of Pittsburgh, they're all having this, this debate, and uh, it, was, it has a lot of pros and a lot of cons in it. Um, you know, at University of California, Santa Clara, our, the professor says, uh, grades are terrible motivators for doing sustained and deep learning. Well, the other side is, is everybody get the same and, you know, the blue ribbon thing and all that. But uh, anyhow, I do, want, I do believe that we need to be more uh, informed and therefore informed our public what is happening on on the different legislation uh, and things are changing rapidly today the, the United States Supreme Court ruled against the state of West Virginia who was had passed a bill to deny transgender students if they now identify as a female or vice versa and it was about a young person who identifies as a female who wanted to be on their middle her middle school uh, track and and uh, cross-country teams, and this bill would have denied her. The Supreme Court, on a seven to two vote, said no, that you can't do that. Well, that's gonna begin to set a precedent. So we're in a changing world, and, uh, but we need to be better aware of it. And we need to, not up, I'm talking about us as individuals too, and as the board, to let our legislators, who apparently aren't getting any input from the California School Board Association, nor nor the teachers, the way I see it on discipline. Uh, we need to let them hear from the, from the local, and that can include y'all. Uh, I'm not gonna use the vaults, but uh, anyone one else. Uh, we're all alarmed about a second grader shooting someone. That's, that's, that's unfathomable, and, uh, but it's a changing world. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Trustee Lee. Um, yeah, Mr. Hunt, it's fun to witness or see those kids with their learning a third grade class in math, but until you actually have to help a third grader at home with their math and a fifth grader, a sixth grader, yeah, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, our standards are no joke. I um, want to just echo what several of my colleagues said regarding safety. Safety is paramount. Uh, I have three young kids. I want to thank all the parents out here this evening for, for sharing their concerns. Um, as a parent, as a board member, as a community member, uh, I have the same concerns. 
you know, every day when I drop my kids off at school, I want to make sure I'm going to pick them up in the same condition. Um, so know that while we can't respond specifically to a lot of your questions from up here and your concerns, um, your questions are heard, they're felt, they're listened to, um, and know that we are doing something, even if, even if you don't see it. Uh, so thank you all for being here this evening. Also, as we approach the home stretch of the school year, I think we have about six weeks left. It's hard to believe. Um, it's not easy to be in the field of education these days, whether you're a teacher or an aide or a custodian or a nutrition services. So I want to thank each and every one of our employees, no matter what chair they sit in for, serving our students and serving our community to the best that they can, um, and also for, for challenging us um, through their proper channels to, to get better and do better. So providing that constructive feedback so that as a policy making board, we can hopefully uh, make changes to make the experience for our employees better. So in, in, in essence, that makes uh, our students have a better experience because ultimately that's what we're all here, not only to keep our kids safe, but make sure that we fulfill our obligation to our students so that they can progress and, and be successful in whatever they do after us. So. Uh, thank you to all of our educators uh, throughout the district, um, and uh, good luck on the rest of the school year. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Trustee Kinnear. Thanks, President uh, Farouk. Uh, I, too, uh, express my uh, thanks to, to people uh, in their discussion on, uh, on discipline issues from an old high school principal for many years uh, during some challenging times. Uh, I know the importance of, of discipline at, at a site, not only in the classroom, but on campus and before school and, uh, and after school. A and it is a concern of ours, and it is taken very seriously. Uh, I also want to th uh, thank Mr. Hunt. I think it's a great idea, uh, at least for me, uh, to, uh, to, to place pertinent laws and and uh, proposed legislation on our web page and, and directly to board members, I, I don't have access to some of that. Uh, so if, uh, if, if we have folks that, that can help us with it, uh, I think it would be a great thing. I hope uh, everyone's spring break was, was, uh, was safe and relaxing, and I hope it provided uh, sufficient downtime uh, for people to be energized during these uh, last six or seven weeks of, of, of school. Uh, so it is a race, you know, we're trying to do the best that we can uh, and the end of the school year is really the last leg of, of that race. Uh, I know many staff members at Ramona uh, started or ended their spring break a day early uh, on Sunday. Uh, Ramona just experienced their, their uh, accreditation process with their visiting committee. It's a, it's a, 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 a stressful time uh, for administration and teachers uh, because it, it's really a culmination of, of, of hard work. Uh, so I appreciate the, the work that Ramona staff did in preparing for, uh, for that visitation. I appreciate the, the, the visiting committee. I had a chance to, uh, to meet them. They represent a, a variety of, of uh, uh, discipline areas, discipline areas in, uh, in education. Uh, they, uh, they, they took their, their job with Ramona seriously. Uh, I look forward, and I know the visit was a successful uh, visit. Uh, I know that after talking to, to Principal Cisneros uh, at another event, uh, that he said that, that there were no surprises and the, and the strengths and, and areas for improvement that, that have been identified by Ramona staff members were confirmed by the, the, the visiting committee. I look forward to receiving a copy of, uh, of the visiting committee's uh, uh, Summary. I don't want their whole report. I don't need 75 pages, uh, but their summary would be helpful uh, as, uh, as well as the, the summary of, uh, of the school staff. Uh, you know, I saw uh, Principal Cisneros at the, at the Latino Network uh, event, uh, the, the breakfast the, uh, the other morning, and it was a great event. Uh, I think I, I thanked our staff members 
uh, who work on that event, I think a year ago, uh, I would like to, to thank them again uh, because I think Riverside Unified School District staff uh, has played an important part of, uh, of the, uh, for the Latino network and deservedly so. So thanks staff. Uh, I also attended the, the PTA Council uh, uh, Awards celebration honoring staff and, and notable volunteers. And I tried to count back uh, it was, uh, it's my 25th time attending that ceremony. That's, that's, uh, that's a lot of PTA ceremonies. And it was one of the best. I appreciated the, the international theme uh, that, uh, that they had for the event. I also appreciated the pace of the event. It went by very, very quickly for, for the large numbers of, uh, of folks that uh, that they celebrated not only staff members uh, but uh, but also uh, volunteers that they uh, they they supported all those that 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 work closely with uh, with with PTA. I do want to uh, to shout out a special appreciation to the the PTA's business of the year, and that's uh, Country Kitchen. Uh, I think it's a restaurant out uh, on, uh, on La Sierra, and uh, they were nominated by the Lake Matthews uh, staff, uh, and uh, we appreciate the, the support from uh, our businesses in our community. Uh, PTA leadership uh, announced the incredible 5,700 plus hours uh, that volunteers give to, to PTA. Uh, and then each year they, they equate those hours to a dollar amount. Uh, but uh, as uh, uh, one of our board members alluded to, you know, it, the dollar amount is really priceless. It's not the dollar amount that they, they, they put on their, their check that they're most likely to, uh, to uh, award us with. Uh, it's, it's, it's really great. And finally, I, I want to say something about, uh, about my visit today to Martin Luther King. And it, it, uh, it also uh, goes to Mr. Hunt's comment uh, about uh, uh, watching learning happen with, uh, with kids, no matter what their age, is, uh, is just a, a, a joyful, incredible uh, opportunity for us as board members. Uh, MLK's project leadership, uh, or project lead the way, uh, their seniors put on a spectacular showcase in engineering today. Uh, students were well prepared uh, in their projects. Uh, they talked about the successes of their projects and also the, the areas that they would improve. They're very, very critical about the, the work that, uh, that they do. Uh, one such project designed, built, and tested a device that would utilize water drainage to provide power. Uh, to, uh, to, to operate a, a device. And, and they concluded that, that Southern California was, was not a, a, a wonderful place to, uh, uh, to or well suited uh, to, to their project uh, with, uh, with the uh, uh, importance of water. But an, another project was a teddy bear, which announced blood sugar levels for children with, uh, with, with diabetes, an incredible project. Uh, by the, a group of students. Uh, good job once again to the Project Lead the Waste uh, students. Thank you, President. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. <clears throat> I'll just, it's uh, hard not to be a little bit redundant with my comments um, after hearing from all of my esteemed colleagues. Um, but I want to begin just by, I, I know I alluded to it earlier, but really just want to reiterate uh, student board member Briscoe. I really uh, appreciate just the, the the foundationally just the humanity of where you're coming from and just how important that is. Uh, you articulated it, you know, better than I can imagine. So I just really want to express that. Uh, you know, I think, you know, just as my colleagues mentioned, you know, I uh, have a, a daughter in our school system as well. And just how much, you know, safety weighs on our, all of our minds. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's tough because as, as, my, as they mentioned, my colleagues, that you know, we we are more aware of, of what the, what kind of the the breadth and the scope and the comprehensive nature of the responses, and I hope you know I, I will if the, whether it's a challenge our, our administration or others of how we can thread the needle of the very legitimate uh, privacy components as well as protecting the methods and means of the nature of how we do things uh, for obvious reasons. 
um, but at the same time, you know, making sure that uh, our our community and our family can have the, the peace of mind, knowing you know the, the again the the breadth of how we are responsive. So uh, um, I, it's not an enviable task on how we can thread that needle, but I, I hope that's something we can really make a, a con continued effort to do that. Uh, and you know, to some of the other comments that were mentioned regarding our special needs, the AIDS, the need for uh, for more, um, the CSEA, the the concern uh, with the violation. Um, our, I'm sure our administration will be following up on all these things. Um, the l last thing I'll, I'll just mention uh, at the, the that I thought was well said at the P PTA meeting uh, with. Uh, Principal Shaw from uh, Miller Middle School was just about the spirit of finishing strong. You know, we're at that point of the school year where you know we're getting into the recognitions and uh, uh, acknowledgments for our student achievement, our employees. I mean, a variety of different areas, uh, and we still have uh, a, a ways to go to um, before we get to the graduations and the end of the year ceremonies. And so uh, to all of us uh, involved in, uh, in public education, our, our parents, our employees, our students, most first and foremost, uh, for us to finish the school year strong. So I really uh, want to implore that. So we'll now uh, head to uh, the consent calendar, which are considered to be uh, routine and be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the board vote unless members of the board request to have specific items removed from the consent calendar. Uh, Trustee Hunt has provided me uh, comment cards uh, uh, regarding consent agenda items and uh, we can start with Ms. R on item J6. Welcome. So I think I misplaced my paper. I want to say it was um, Silver Creek Industries is the one that it mentions that it was a non-bid. So I just want to confirm with all of you that you'll, uh, we expect that you'll be disclosing if you took any contributions from Silver Creek. Um, because if, if you don't disclose and we do go back on your 460 forms and find that you did receive over 250 within the last 12 months, it is a misdemeanor. You can nod your head at me. I really plan on filing a complaint about your harassment towards me at all of these meetings. It is completely unprofessional and it's going to stop. If I have to go to Mike Hestrin about your Brown Act, you know, treatment of, of people coming to speak, I, I don't attack you personally. I don't say anything about your personal life. I'm attacking policies. I'm attacking decisions that affect our children. And yet you are completely rude and unprofessional. I look at these other board members, they either avoid my look or they just acknowledge me and are professional and you're completely rude. Just stop. I was coming here tonight and I initially planned on apologizing to you and I'm really glad I did not. Thank you, Ms. R. Our next speaker is Crystal White. Welcome, Ms. White. You have three minutes. Uh, good evening, members of the school board. My name is Crystal White. As you may recall from the emails I sent all of you, um, I'm a parent of two children who have been attending schools in RUSD since 2014. I'm here today to bring to your attention a serious issue that's been affecting my daughter's third grade class. I realize I missed a little bit of this, but I'm tying it in. There's a student in her class who has a troubling history of violence, bullying, harassment, and victimization of other students. This behavior has been going on since the student started Twain in TK. Recently, this student has made multiple, multiple threats of having guns and a pocket knife at school and even going so far as saying that he will blow up the school. What's even more alarming is that despite this directly involving my child, I was never notified. Can you imagine the trauma this kind of situation can inflict on an eight-year-old child? I certainly can't. As a concerned parent, I have tried to bring this to the attention of the school and district officials and I have been ignored, dismissed, and told it's not a big deal. In today's world, where we unfortunately hear about school shootings all too often, I find it unacceptable that this situation doesn't seem to be taken very seriously, and I refuse to sit around and do nothing and wait until my child becomes a victim. My child, along with every other child in the school district, deserves to feel safe and secure while re receiving an education. As parents, we trust you with our most precious gift, our children. I understand that times can be challenging, but asking for communication and transparency is not too much to ask for. It's the bare minimum that we can expect from our school district. 
While I acknowledge that the violent child involved in this situation also has rights and needs to be addressed, my question is what about the rights of my child and the other children to feel safe and be in a safe environment? Why is their safety not the top priority? And why has RUSD allowed this situation to persist for almost five years? This situation should warrant expulsion. I urge the school board to take swift and appropriate action to address this issue and ensure the safety of all the students in the district. It's time to prioritize the well-being of our children and create an environment where they can thrive without fear. Thank you for your attention in this matter. Thank you, Ms. White. So I'll turn now uh, to my colleagues. If anybody would like to pull any items before we take a, a full vote. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. I would like to pull consent item J1. Um, I just need to make, I, I'd like to make some amendments on the 3-16-23 minutes. Sure. Two of them. Uh, one is, uh, in the count was um, recorded twice, but in one instance it says the uh, uh, the vote that it that it passed with five yeas and z and zero nos. There was actually one no. There mm -hmm. was five yeas and one no. So they'd like to make that uh, correction. And the other one was in the original motion. The original motion. Um, uh, I would like to make the correction to remove um, possible implementation because I didn't say possible implementation. I uh, moved to enter into negotiations. Okay, thank you for that uh, clarification. Uh, do you wanna make a motion on that sp specific item standalone then? Yes. Okay, yeah. uh, do we have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Hunt, please vote. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, Trustee Hunt, do you want to say? Thank you. I'd like to pull uh, item J6 uh, because it is confusing, not confusing enough that someone should make baseless allegations on, on something that would be illegal. But it is confusing uh, that we're, I mean, when you just read it, that we're going to have no bids. And the rush to do it is, uh, needs to be explained from the funding source. So I would appreciate pulling that and letting the staff and or the superintendent have she directs respond okay uh we can pull j6 are there any other uh, agenda consent agenda items that anyone wants to pull okay uh um student board member briscoe would you want to consider a motion you, you don't have to <laughs> there we go <laughs> I would like to make a motion to approve consent calendar items J1 through J16 and omit items J17 and J18. Okay, and we would omit one since we already voted on it oh, yeah. and omit uh, six because Trustee Hunt is pulling that. Okay. It, it, are you okay with those amendments? Yes. Okay, uh, do we have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Lee, please vote. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Let's uh, go back to uh, item J6. If Mr. San Martin, could you please take us through this? Thank you, President Farouk. Um, this item has to do with um, Silver Creek, a contract that we have with Silver Creek. This contract, and Silver Creek is a manufacturer, modular manufacturer for the project team project. Um, this project, this contract was awarded and bidded in, in, on August 2022. Um, we went through the awarding, the public works process, and the board awarded the contract sometime in September. Um, this item we're bringing to the board today because Silver Creek, part of their contract is to design, take the project through the D Division State Architect, which they did, but part two of their contract was to manufacture those modulars. In order to manufacture those, those modulars, they needed to provide to the board, to the district, their bonding and performance documents, which as of today, they have failed to do that. They were supposed to do that um, early in February, as soon as they received the, the Division State Architect approved plans. Uh, so they're in default in contract. And so what we're doing tonight is uh, a procedure of our contracts to uh, terminate their contract. 
Uh, in doing that, we have the ability to award it to a different manufacturer um, without bidding because we already have completed that and complied with state statutory requirements. Now, with us tonight is also our legal counsel, Hewley, who can answer specific questions on this process and on this contract. Any questions from the board? Or we can have the, Mr. Hewley to... He's here right now. Hey, yes, Trustee Hunt. And I'm not... Thank you, Assistant Superintendent. I'm not questioning your process. But wouldn't... In, a, in some jobs I've overseen, bonding is so critical. Uh, wouldn't you ask in for pre-qualification about their bonding information. I know it changes. Usually it's a year bond, but wouldn't you ask for that in the beginning instead of us finding ourselves now? And I'm glad you're, you're moving so quickly to having to redo this, but go ahead, sir. Be before yes, you answer, have, sir, I'm going to ask Mr. Before you Mr. answer, Hewley. yeah, I would suggest you guys go to the podium and that way you guys can trade Yes, Mr. Hewley can answer that question. Oh, introduce, okay. Good evening. To address your answer, yes, it's a statutory requirement to provide 100% payment, 100 payment performance bonds. This was the second part of the project, as Sergio had mentioned. They failed to do that. Um, that is critical. We just cannot proceed without those bonds. And so that's why we found them in default. And then there's case law that says when you find a contractor in default, you can bypass the public bidding requirements. Can you, in the future, can you please raise your mic a little bit closer? To, thank you. Uh, Trustee Hunt. Do you want to respond to that? Or? Uh, that so the, the first part of the project, they were bonded, and then for phase two, they're not, we discovered, or? They did not need to be bonded for the first part because that was just designed. That was designed. Correct. Okay, thank you. That's very, thank you for that excellent. Thank you, Mr. So, President. So thank you. I, I actually do have a question on, on this matter also. So I understand that it says case law says that we, um, it's not required if they can be exempt from competitive bidding. My only question is why, why should we do that? Why shouldn't we do competitive bidding to get a better price? There are several factors. One is the project is subject, it's eligible for certain funding, including federal funding, and we have to meet certain deadlines. And we discussed it with the staff. We just could not make the timeline work to go out to competitive bid again. In addition, when we went out the first time, we only got the bid from Silver Creek. So it's a very, there's only a few manufacturers that can do this work. And so there really is no advantage. It's a, a small group of contractors that can actually do this work. So we all decided after talking with staff that it was in the best interest for funding to keep the project on its course to go ahead with this uh, uh, procedure. Thank you for providing that important context. Uh, since we have no other comments, uh, we can entertain a motion on items J6. Oh, Dr. Uh, Hernandez Alexander, do you have a question? One is clarifying and the other is um, just a question. So our understanding is that Silver Creek is no longer going to be working on this project. Is that correct? Because they no longer qualify, they didn't produce the proper proof. Yes, because they didn't provide the bonds. We found them in breach of uh, the okay. contract and we sent out a notice of default. So then the next question is, in interest of time, we're moving forward. We're not going to be uh, opening up for a competitive bid. Have we already decided on someone? Has somebody already come forth? Have we already contracted someone? I, they are talking to qualified uh, modular manufacturers okay. to do the work. And I think the intent is to talk to a few and get the best competitive price. So although it's not a strict competitive bid, they are going to look at the various vendors to see who gives the best price the best service and all of the factors to make the best decision. So essentially this, the process will be the same, it just won't be an official open bid. Correct. Or call it that, okay. So from those that are eligible and are qualified, we will seek the best bid out of those few that are, okay. Yes, absolutely. We'll be vetting these uh, manufacturers, going through requests for proposals, which is not a statutory bid but is a process of selection also yes okay thank you thank you trustee hunt i want to say and thank you for what you're doing and thank you sir for that explanation i know i oversaw it's been a long time but i oversaw the project at cal baptist which is called the cottages where they use modulars uh, which was the first time it ever been used for non-single family etc and uh, in the state of california it is very difficult to find 
quality and qualified modular manufacturers in this state. Many of them have left because of the different rules and regulations the state has brought down on that industry. But, but with that, and thank you, Dr. Farouk, again for allowing me to ask the comments, I move to approve item J6 on the consent calendar as presented. Can, uh, Trustee Hunt, can you uh, consider adding J17 and J18? Because that was exempt from her uh, uh, student board member Bisco's motion. Yes, sir. I, I certainly will. Thank you. I'll, I'll add that as you stated. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we have a motion uh, for J6, J17, J18. Do we have second. a second? Second. Trustee Kinnear, please vote. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will now proceed to our action portion of the agenda. The first action item uh, for consideration tonight is a request for the board to consider approval of board policy 4218 uh, regarding disciplinary action. Uh, Super uh, Assistant Superintendent Ibarra. Yes, good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, members of the board. I bring back to you tonight the second read and it is recommended that the Board of Education consider approval of the new board policy 4218 dismissal suspension disciplinary action which is being presented again for the second read so that you remember this simply formalizes the ed code contract and language that we already have along with our practices that are in place and was also part of the CSBA recommendation for this board policy we do currently have an AR and it is parallels what we have in place for our certificated employees too Thank you, Ms. Ibarra, and the AR refers to the administrative regulations. Uh, I'll now turn to our board clerk, Trustee Hunt. Do we have any uh, cards submitted for this item? Okay, thank you. Ms. S Sandy R., welcome. You have three minutes. Okay, so again, this policy is, the, is adding language to say that if a teacher's beliefs, politics, social, whatever, conflicts with one of your policies, that you can dismiss them. That you won't dismiss them for any other reason, but if they conflict with one of your policies, then you will. Well, okay, so let's say we challenge, give you an example. So you have the scenario with Jessica Tapia in Harupa Valley where she was let go because she did, was not okay with having boys in the girls' locker room, and she was not okay with being compelled to use pronouns that went against her religious beliefs. So that was not okay with that district, and they dismissed her, even though it had nothing to do with an in incident with the student. So now, let's come and give you an example of the opposite. I brought to this board's attention a situation with one of your teachers on special assignment in her hateful anti-Christian speech that she was spreading on social media who happens to be related and friends with several of these board members, and nothing was done. That, again, is against your board policies. It's against constitutionally protected faith, and yet you guys did nothing. So you're picking and choosing which protected classes you want to respond to, and that's not okay. So while I appreciate your perspective as a student board member here with regards to your perspective, you have to also respect that not everyone agrees with your perspective. And there are plenty of people that feel that it's a violation of their religious beliefs to be forced to, to go along with 5145.3 policy. What are you going to tell a Mormon student who has, for their religious beliefs, has to be modest? They have to be modest even in their own personal relationships. And yet you're going to tell them, it's okay, we're going to put a boy in the locker room with you. In your mind, he's a girl. In her mind, he's a boy. And that's the issue. These girls clearly came out and said, this was a culmination of harassment that they were dealing with that student. That this was not a one-time fight with this student. And to now, to make him out to be the victim, he is not the victim. He was the aggressor in that fight. And parents are not gonna be okay with it. The next time he hurts a student, you're gonna have a lawsuit. The next teacher that you fire, you're gonna have a lawsuit just like Haruba Valley will. So you have to respect all protected classes. You don't get to pick and choose the ones that suit your, your you know, ideologies. They're all protected under the law. So we're the taxpayers. We don't want to waste our money on lawsuits because you're picking and choosing the ideologies you want to protect. 
Thank you, Ms. Har. I'll now turn to my colleagues for comments or questions or to entertain a motion. Trustee Hunt. Thank you, Dr. Berg. Assistant Superintendent, just tell me how this policy aligns with what the state has sent down to us and uh, did we add anything or subtract anything? Is, this, is the district following the state's edicts on this? This is a classified policy, so for our classified employees. So this is what's already in place based on Ed Code, based on their um, rights with regards to their contract and with regards to procedures that are already in place. So there are still steps in place to support in any of the classified employees based okay. on the law and based on their classified contract that would support them being able to go through the process ba based on progressive discipline. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Thank you. So thank you for clarifying this to me. Um, Sister Superintendent did sit me down and explain it to me, so I, feel, I do feel comfortable with it. But for the purpose of the public's understanding, um, when you say classified, you mean non-teachers, right? Yes, this right. is for classified employees, mm -hmm. non-teachers. There's already a policy in place, um, board policy and um, AR, which is our administrative regulations that align with this. So you're essentially, what this policy is in essence saying is that there will be a process. Absolutely. Similar to when, as there is one for teachers, that there will be a similar, or the same process, a mirrored process-ish, no? It's mirrored, but remember, classified and certificated have a few different nuances with okay. regards to their um, rights within their own associations as to what they have. Different when it comes to discipline, they have their skelly hearings. There's different hearing processes that they both have, but it, it is a mirrored process. Yes. So it's a, it's about the process. It's Correct. not about deciding what we think is wrong or punishable. C it's Correct. about the about everyone having a process. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, student board member Briscoe. Thank you. I would just like to address the comment that was said. Um, I completely understand what you're saying. I think that there, that's a topic that has come up a lot with religion, with uh, identity, also with sexuality. I also think that begs the question, which triumphs someone's religious beliefs or someone's human rights? I think that people should be validated and they should be seen for who they are. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the process um, with what it takes to get a diagnosis for having gender dysphoria, but it's extensive. It goes through, people go through therapy. I personally know people who have gone through therapy to get that diagnosis and it doesn't happen based off of a whim. A uh, cisgendered male does not suddenly identify as a woman. It is a process that happens throughout childhood. I would like to see if there's a way to find common ground between people who are religious and students who identify as something differently, but regardless, students are in our district that have identities that are unique, that need to be included. That's it, thank you. Thank you, student board member Briscoe. Uh, do we have, um, oh, Tr Trustee Kinnear, did you have something further? I was going to make a motion to approve. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to approve. Second by Trustee Hunt. Please vote. Remember our student board member to give the advisory vote first on all, all of our votes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Our next action item is a request uh, for the board to consider the approval of the plan for the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant. Ms. Power. Yes, good evening, Dr. Farouk, Pres uh, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. Tonight, the presentation is still coming up, but tonight we are seeking board approval of our plan to spend the arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant. Um, if you remember, the original allocation was for this year, and it was $24.3 million. Um, and in his January budget, the governor proposed a 34% reduction for this year, which would equate to about $16 million for RUSD. 
Now, we don't know if that will actually happen until the state budget is adopted, um, but for now, we're planning on $16 million for that allocation. So for this plan, there is no prescribed format uh, or due date, but we, the board must approve our spending plan before we can spend the funds. So here you see the allowable uses of the funds. While the name of the funds include the words arts and music, um, you can see there are lots of different uses. Uh, we can spend the funds on professional development, instructional materials, developing diverse book collections, operational costs, including uh, retirement and healthcare costs supplies related to the COVID-19 pandemic, and to support arts and music education programs. Now these funds were part of the funding planning process that we went through as a district and a board throughout this fiscal year. And we looked at the uh, funding and the allowable uses. And we considered that the board has allocated uh, $4 million ongoing in the LCAP alone for VAPA, uh, Visual and Performing Arts. And the board has long supported Visual and Performing Arts in doing that. Um, we also are looking forward to implementing Proposition 28 next year. That is different than this. This is a separate funding source than Proposition 28. Proposition 28 is specifically for arts and music education, and it is ongoing, and we will receive funds for that purpose. Uh, the preliminary estimate was $7 million for RUSD uh, starting next year, but it is based on a percentage of total Proposition 98 funding, so that, could, that will change, and it, it will likely go down uh, based on revenue estimates, but we still are receiving a good, uh, fairly large dollar amount for Proposition 28. In light of that, as, uh, to achieve the priorities that were decided on by the board and um, staff and all of our educational partners, um, the staff recommendation is to spend the funds on category four there which is our state teachers retirement system and our public employees retirement system. What this will do will allow us to reallocate the dollars that are currently earmarked for those costs and spend them um, in an unrestricted manner on the priorities that were decided on. So here you can see our STRS and PERS costs over the years. Uh, the, percentage, the percentages shown are percentages of every dollar um, is what we're paying for STRS and PERS and our total costs across the bottom there. So again, we have these funds budgeted for this purpose and spending the um, discretionary grant on these costs will allow us to reallocate dollars and they will not be restricted and they will not have timelines. So it allows for flexibility in the spending. So in summary, um, the plan for the funds would be to spend them on STRS and PERS, which is an authorized use of the restricted funds. And this would allow for the reallocation of those funds to support board priorities. Uh, such as shade structures and safety and security enhancements, which were discussed at the funding planning workshop and throughout the year. And so this will allow us to achieve those priorities. And that is the end of the presentation. So I will step aside for public comment. Thank you, Ms. Power. We have one public comment from Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. I just want to say it's shameful when taxpayers hear about grants and projects like this we think art and music it's the first thing you say on that grant it's an art and music grant and yet they're not going to see any of the money none of it so you're going to take this money that's already that you know you're going to get about 16 million on the promise of maybe getting more money you already know that the government the governor has said that we're going to be in a deficit so you know you're going to be getting less money on a go forward so the fact that you're using every dime of this money to cover your retirement hole that you get into because 
since the teachers union elects you guys, you have to give it all back to them. So that's why your stirs and purrs are so high. Um, again, it's not okay. Parents expect that some of this money is going to impact our students, and it's not. I'm sure there's plenty of music and art teachers that would have loved to have some of this money going into their classrooms. It's not okay. It's just, it's shameful the way that you guys are just making this decision and you don't even care how it impacts students or, or music and art teachers. And that's what it's supposed to be for. Thank you, Ms. R. <clears throat> we will now turn to board member comments, starting with Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent Power. Um, during um, a meeting, I, I brought this very thing up, right? Like, this looks bad. Uh, we're moving um, money from the arts into our retirements, or not our, our retirements. I do not participate in the retirement plan, just for the record. Um, but uh, uh, Superintendent Hill really dumbed it down for me in a, in a way that, she, uh, that I was able to understand it. I mean, she was talking about buckets, and then she was talking about how some buckets are open and some buckets are closed, and how it's really not, that's not what we're actually doing. We're not actually taking art money into retirement money. We're actually moving things in buckets that open and close. So I don't know if, if, we're, <laughs> if Superintendent Hill can talk about buckets or if you have a way to, to, to simplify it, but I, I know what it looks like, but it was, I was made to understand how it's not exactly that. So if you can help us, if you can elaborate a little bit, that would be helpful. Well, Super now I have to talk about I, buckets. I <laughs> In my explanation, I was just saying we have the general fund. That is money we spend anyway. The grant is additional dollars that has restrictions on it. So in the general fund money that we spend anyway is the retirement cost that we're going to pay for anyway. So we, take, we charge that to the grant because it's restricted. We charge that to the grant instead because it's allowed. And that makes the $16 million available for some items that the board decided were important for the benefit of, of students. The examples that Assistant uh, Superintendent Power put on there were um, shade structures because it's been a long standing request from parents to have more strict shade structures available for students and for safety because uh, it's been a, not as long-standing, but recent, especially, and we, we, we got the consultant to help us make a plan to do safety. Um, to the point of the, with the grant being named Arts and Music, like Assistant Super, Superintendent Power said, our board has had a long-standing commitment to arts and music, even in lean times. So we have currently $4 million ongoing in the budget for arts and music. We have an arts and music plan, a five-year plan, that talks about how that support will continue throughout the years, and we expect uh, the dollars from Prop 28 to come. So general fund bucket, grant bucket. PERS costs are going into the grant, making that open for purposes to benefit students. That was great, thank you. <laughs> Trustee Hunt. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Power, and thank you, Superintendent, for that explanation. I know that just to her point, going back to 2008 and 9 and 10, when, we, when this district had to cut from a $430 million budget, $105 million, we never touched the arts. And I'm not thinking we're changing it now. Um, so how does, because you, you had me at shade structures, how does, uh, you're gonna transfer this money, I'm fine with that. It, the legislature may call it the arts grant, but they, you know, they, I mean, they have four, five different items you can spend on, including COVID and developing diverse book collections and culturally relevant texts. But, so you're gonna get some of that money from 78? I'm sorry, what? what 98. No, 98, I know it's, 1% has to be for the arts, right? So depending on, is that where it's all coming from or do you have other buckets that you're gonna be choosing that money from which allows us to broader? All right, can you clarify? Yeah, are you no, talking No, I mean, I, yes, for everything that we're gonna use the 16, we're taking the 16.9 and putting it 
where we're allowed to, which is, uh, uh, it, it talks about those the operational, operational costs. costs. Yes. So where's the other, where's the replacement 16.9 coming from exactly? And when will it be here? And how do we buy shaved structures with it? Yes. So the, I, I do want to clarify that the amount is 16 million estimated, but it could be 24 million. It could be somewhere in between 16 million and 24 million. I just want to oh, okay. everyone to understand that this approving this plan will be for whatever the total amount we end up getting for this uh, grant. Because you saw we had 80 million dollars in stirs and purse costs, so we have uh, plenty of costs to spend these dollars on. Now, those funds will come from the state allocation. We already have received some of them because the allocation is for this year. Okay. Um, we will, it will be trued up once the budget is adopted for next year. And then we'll be able to spend those dollars on STRS and PERS, thus freeing up what we already have in the budget for 23-24 um, for shade structures and safety and security. And that will be 23 and 24 in states for the shade and the security. Yes. And then as long as it takes, if it's five years, we have those funds. It's now, it will now be unrestricted and no timelines. So the board can put it in the fund balance and then spend it on shade structures over the years as, as it, you know, as building the shade structures will take some time. Good. I, I know when I was at Lake Matthews today, even though they have two nice ones, uh, that was one of... Uh, the principal's concerns was about shade, and I know we're going to plant some trees there, but shade's very important and security. So I want to commend you for uh, your ingenuity here, uh, thinking outside the box, because school district funding, I've always been impressed, not with wow, but wow. How do you operate a business like, like this? And so uh, I'm glad you went out there, and I appreciate Assistant Superintendent, and I'll be glad to do a motion when you're prepared, sir. Thank you. We have further, further comments before we get to that point, uh, starting with student board member Risco. Hi, so I do have a question. So kind of frank, but I know that we've, if I'm right, we recently expanded uh, musical groups to go into fourth grade, right? So with this money, are we going to see anything physically different within our music programs? No. no. Okay. That's it. <laughs> Okay, thank you, student board member Briscoe. Uh, Trustee Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk. <clears throat> so this is a little bit repetitive, but um, I, I, I had the same concerns as Dr. Alexander mentioned regarding, um, you know, are we finding a loophole? Are we operating, trying to find ways to circumvent the intentions or the spirit of, of this grant? Um, but I think you just have to keep reading, right? It says arts, music, and instructional materials, discretionary block grant, right? So it is a terrible name, no mm -hmm. doubt about it. It's a terrible name, um, but it's the intent, obviously, by the legislation, by listing these uses, uh, is that it was to provide discretion to districts to allocate the funds as best need possible. We're fortunate as a district that um, we've been committed to the arts uh, so much so that we put an arts plan together a few years ago and have increased funding over the years towards that plan. So while, yes, it would be nice to have, I think we had a, I think we called it like silver, gold, and platinum, or one, two, and three, and we're at that middle tier plan. Um, would it be nice to have that, that third plan? Yeah, of course it would be nice. Um, but when we went through the process of talking to the community, talking to school sites, we identified the need for student safety, which we heard a bunch of parents out here tonight talking about student safety and making our campuses more secure and also the shade, right? That retirement has to get paid no matter what. And it has nothing to do with negotiations with our bargaining units. It has to do with what the state allocates the percentage of, of uh, our, our commitment to the retirement system. So that's gonna get paid at a sum bucket, no matter what. So to me, this makes the most sense um, despite the terrible name for the grant, and I'm um, mm -hmm. just grateful that there's uh, extra funds that the state is distributing back to the communities that is going to allow us to keep our commitments uh, to our employee groups, but still providing um, some safety and a better physical environment for our students uh, to attend. So I want to commend you, Ms. Power, and your team for, um, you know, presenting this in the way that you did, kind of sharing that and demonstrating that, that 
we are acting in the spirit of this grant um, and trying to make that clear despite the terrible name from Sacramento. So thank you thank for you. that. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Trustee Kinnear. Thanks. Uh, two, two things. First, well said, Mr. Lee. I, th I think there's, uh, there's a couple of incredible things with this. One uh, is the name and how we could name it this. Uh, knowing that there are many more purposes that uh, that the funds can be used for. I mean, uh, why we do that, I, I don't know. The, the second thing is uh, how we can allocate $23 million for this school year and then say this school year, you don't really have $23 million, uh, you only have $16 million, but that's even a maybe. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I think it's conservative in, in, in your estimate that we're going to get the, the 16 million, but, uh, but it's incredible that the, that the state can, can, can say you're going to get this and then you're not going to get it mm -hmm. when we're uh, three quarters of the way through the school year. Uh, and I think my last point would be that if there is more money uh, that, that comes from this grant, then you're going to bring that back to us uh, when, uh, when, when, when that comes that we're committing 16.1 million uh, to do the shade structures and the, and the, and the uh, uh, security. Uh, and then if there's more than $16 million that comes to us via this grant, then, then you know, we'll see that difference once again. Yes, we would still spend it in the same way on STRS and PERS based on your approval of the plan tonight, but then there would be the additional dollars to allocate to something, yes. Thank you. I, um, I just have, so I, you know, I acknowledge and appreciate where my colleagues are coming from uh, regarding, I, I understand the logic behind the, the flexibility of funds and that uh, this is not impacting the already uh, commitment we have with our baseline uh, arts funding, which is, uh, it's, and it's not, just one caveat I'll say to Trustee Lee's comment, it's tiered in the way that he mentioned, but that's relative to our standards, which is beyond, you know, what typical school districts do. Uh, uh, in terms of th that, my only comment that I'll add um, th that's not, I guess, redundant would be uh, regardless of which bucket is paying for it, because uh, to me that part's not as, as material, and I get the flexibility aspect of you know using the restricted funds. But um, if there is a scenario where we, w when you're getting a, a, a grant that is, that's being marketed and branded in this context of increasing whatever the overall baseline of arts funding for the district is. You said it's four million, right? Uh, and then we're potentially anticipating seven million from that uh, state proposition. That's 11 million. If, if, if there's overall a net greater positive than what the, uh, the existing baseline was, um, it, uh, you know, with this maneuverability, it, 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 you know, I think that would be something good to explore. Is there something you want to say? Okay. Um, yes, Dr. Fruk, thank you. Um, if there if there were uh, additional dollars, then we would use a process similar to how we did with the um, the funding workshop, because we got a lot of information from stakeholders and board. You took a lot of time to consider your priorities, um, and you know, as Dr. Hansen used to say, we can do anything. We just can't do everything. So of course, there's a a, a left over list of, of other um, things that, that we could fund. So when this will first come back, you'll see it when we adopt our budget for the year because those funding workshop decisions will be into that budget. That's why we did that then and are doing this now so we can shape the budget like you would like to see it. Sure, thank you for that context. Trustee Lee? If there was no further comments, I was gonna make a motion to approve item to on the action calendar. Okay, so tr Trustee Hunt, is, is that okay with you? Yeah, or did you want yes, to make, sir, that's just you, fine. You I'll, want to be the I'll second? second his okay. motion. Thank you, sir. Motion by Trustee Lee, second by Trustee Hunt. Uh, please vote. All right, uh, the motion carries unanimously and uh, I've been requested for us to take a 10 minute recess. So we will re-adjourn at 7.53 p.m.
item agenda, which is a request for the board to consider the approval of the purchase and adoption of new alternate curriculum materials for students with exceptional needs. I'll turn it over to Ms. Kirsten Frosto. Thank you. We are very excited to be here this evening. Good evening, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. We are here this evening to seek approval from the Board of Education on a new alternate curriculum to support students with exceptional needs in our moderate to severe special day classes as recommended by our committee. A little bit of information about what those programs are. We serve approximately 600 students in this program. It serves students with varying abilities who have developmental, many have developmental delays. The programs provide increased intensive supports. What that looks like is some smaller class sizes with a reduced student to adult ratio, as well as a focus both on academics as well as social skills and our functional life skills so that we can ensure we're preparing our students for that transition to adulthood and the workforce. In order to help you consider this recommendation this evening, we'll be covering three big buckets of items. One, a review of the process that we used and our committee, as well as hear from two amazing educators who participated as committee members and also piloted the materials and then a review of the cost and fiscal impact of those materials. So as we looked at considering these materials and selections, it was very important for us to align to our district priority, specifically learning for every student every day, and also our four instructional focus areas as outlined by Superintendent Hill. We're very grateful for the support of our adoption committee. We have, as I said, two members here this evening. And I also want to express a special specific thank you to Ms. Kelly Sugden, who's joining us this evening. She is a staff development specialist for special education. And I want to really commend the value of her leadership and facilitation of this entire process. Our committee uh, consists or includes teachers, administrators and support staff from across the school sites and also uh, departments across the district. The adoption committee members were responsible to represent their school sites as well as the grade spans that they serve. They were responsible for sharing this information with their colleagues, getting feedback, and then also uh, being objective and open in this participation. A brief overview of our adoption timeline. We began this work in early September, looking at uh, composing the or collecting the uh, committee members and their interest, and also planning for the process. In October, they met to develop guiding principles for how they were going to evaluate the materials. Throughout November, they engaged in those activities, evaluated the materials, and narrowed that focus to consider two for piloting, which kicked off at the end of November. In February, the team reconvened, and they went through some consensus activities to come up with the recommendation of Teach Town's Encore. From there, the materials went on public display beginning February 14th, and then pending board consideration and recommendation approval tonight, there will be professional development this summer and fall. To give just a few more details about each step, to determine the guiding principles, the team looked at the California state standards, as well as looking at research-based practices for supporting students with exceptional needs. They developed those guiding principles that included high quality instructional practices that looked at increased access and equity for our students, the support of our students who are English learners, as well as support for functional life skills and the supports for transitioning to that adulthood and career and world readiness. The team then used those guiding principles to evaluate the materials and narrowed the choices to down from seven to three. We were 
very surprised and pleasantly surprised because when we considered adoption of materials almost 10 years ago, we only had three to select from. And this time we had seven to select from, which doesn't seem like a lot, but in the world of uh, special education, that is a lot of improvement, more than doubled the amount of materials that we were able to consider. They narrowed that to three publishers who made presentations, and from there, the committee then narrowed it to two to engage in the piloting process. The end of November, those two publishers came and provided training to the staff or to the committee on how to access the uh, programs online, how to utilize the student and teacher materials, and then the pilot began with Teach Towns Encore and Unique Learning Systems and 2Y. They piloted those materials all throughout December as well as January and then came together February 9th where the team engaged in really in-depth discussions about their experiences and collaborated around that and through a consensus activity made the final recommendation for Teach Towns Encore materials. The things that were strengths that really stood out were one, the comprehensiveness of the materials that they included all subject areas, reading, language arts, math, as well as history, social science, and science. They were all standards-based in all of those areas, the accessibility of those life skills, and then also the team was very much impressed with the materials being respectful of our students' chronological age as they met the students' instructional needs, which may be lower than the students' chronological age. It also, by doing that, allowed students to really be included more in general education environments. An example of that here is uh, the adapted literature that's provided from our middle school program in this program for Teach Town. You can see from those titles, those are titles that you would find in any general education class. And so our students, the material on the inside is adapted to their level and it's at three or four different levels so that students, no matter what that varying ability is, can engage with that. Another example is the transition to adulthood lessons. You see an example here that is looking at how to make a purchase with a credit card. So students will learn that skill in the classroom through videos and practicing that skill with the manipulatives and things. And then that's followed up by going into the community on community-based instructional trips and practicing that and generalizing it to, other, to the real world. At this time, I would like to give an opportunity to our two amazing educators that joined us this evening. First, you'll have an opportunity to hear from Rimi Rahman, who is a teacher of grades four through six at Emerson Elementary School. And then following her will be Lisa Murtaugh, as you heard, teaches ninth through 12th grade at Poly High School. Good evening, Superintendent Hill, President Farouk, and esteemed board members. In my years of teaching, I have seen how limited and inaccessible most alternative curricula options have been for our students with moderate to severe disabilities. Encore is a standards-based adaptive curriculum that covers all content areas for grades TK through 12. It provides more comprehensive academic learning opportunities while also addressing important social and functional life skills. My favorite aspect of this curriculum is that the materials are both developmentally and age appropriate for our students. Encore has robust student materials, including individual student workbooks, access to technology, and hands-on manipulatives that will help meet students' diverse learning needs. For example, instead of going over the same English language arts lessons over and over again, year after year, students will now have access to 36 different units covering one fiction book and a nonfiction companion story. Students' augmentative and alternative communication devices will be updated to include core vocabulary from the lessons. And each lesson comes already differentiated into three different levels to address varying learning needs. More excitingly, this will be the first time that our curriculum looks similar to general education curricula, making it easier to provide access to the general education environment and make the transition during mainstreaming and inclusion more seamless. 
The only shortcoming I have found in the curriculum is that it may still not be fully accessible for our students with medically significant disabilities. Teachers will have to further modify and adapt the materials to meet the specific student population's need. But we know this going in, and together we can collaboratively plan and ensure that the student group also has access to the curriculum. I'm very excited to implement this new curriculum with my students. I cannot wait to see them engage in the various materials and watch how it helps them progress, grow, and overall become more well-rounded scholars. Thank you. Good evening. Um, the first question people ask a teacher is, what do you teach, especially if you teach at a high school? My response is, I teach many things, but it's who I teach that's my favorite part. I teach students with a wide variety of abilities. What that looks like in my classroom is this. One student may have a goal of needing to find their name, and another student may have a goal of to answer comprehension questions after independently reading a third grade level text. You can imagine that it would take a very sophisticated curriculum to meet this range of needs. Encore holds many of those keys. Among the expanse of the Encore examples, the one that grabbed my attention the most was the ELA. This curriculum has explicit phonics instruction that's much stronger than our current curriculum. In the area of literature, over 100 titles are at our disposable, disposable, disposal. Um, 35 to 36 of them are actual novels. With authors such as Booker T. Washington, Jane Austen, Leo Tolstoy, and others, we'll be able to give a more diverse and equitable perspective of our world to our students. The included functional skills part of the curriculum, as you saw up there, has explicit photo task analysis, including cooking, health, and life skills instruction. I'm eager to dive into these new tools and challenge our students to become as strong and included in their world as possible. Thank you. I'd like to thank both of our teachers for their, their great words and their commitment and diligence to serving our students, but also to this process of ensuring we have high quality materials for all of our students. The next step in our process was to put the materials on public uh, display at our central registration center that began on February 14th. And in fact, they are still there today if anyone would like to come and see them. We provided notification to the press enterprise, utilized our social media and our family newsletters as well. And also we provided a comprehensive presentation to our special education community advisory committee on March 9th that included that all of the materials as well. The next step pending board approval is our professional development, which will take place in the summer and the fall for teachers this year. There will be two full days provided in the summer and a makeup opportunity for teachers who aren't able to attend in the summer. Those days will provide teachers also an opportunity to dive into the materials, but also to collaborate with each other from across all of the sites. Then there will also be coaching that is also available with this professional development throughout the year. Then in the following years, any new teachers coming onto our campuses will also be trained with those same, um, that same high level of professional development. Highlights from the training are not only use of the materials, but also data collection is very important as we look at developing uh, meaningful individualized education plans for all of our students. The total cost of this materials for the five years of the adoption is $1.5 million, looking at funding sources of textbook lottery, ESSER, and educator effectiveness. What that will include is the materials for uh, approximately 600 of our students in all subject areas, the literature books, libraries that you heard about from our educators, as well as all of the manipulatives, and the print materials for students for all five years, as well as the teacher materials and online access for all five years as well, and the teacher professional development for all five years and coaching. So that concludes the formal presentation, and I'll step aside for any public comment. Thank you all for that uh, great presentation. I'll turn to Trustee Clerk. We have one yes, public sir. comment from Ms. Alicia Ricks. 
Welcome, Ms. Ricks. You have three minutes. Good evening. So I just wanted to say I was honored to be at our last CAC meeting when this was introduced, and we did get a chance to look at the actual textbooks. So I did get to see my, you know, my son's a senior, so I did get to see from where it starts and how it grows between uh, grades. And so um, based on what we have right now, this is a long time coming, and it's going to be great for the students because most of the time we have um, papers that are stapled together that come home with us. Um, and it's been like that since I, since Mikey was little. Um, so I think this is a huge step um, towards one, making sure that these kids are included. They actually have books now, just like all of the other students in general ed. So that's gonna be really nice. Show them that, you know, hey, we're just like the other kids. Like we all, you know, at Poly, it's a, quite an inclusive environment. But I think for, especially going forward, the smaller kids, they get to learn that as well. Um, so I just wanna say thank you and then, um, Thank you, Kristen. And then it was just really amazing to see like these books and how it's going to affect all their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ricks. We'll now turn to our colleagues for comments and questions, starting with Dr. Hernandez Alexander. I I, I want to first um, want to say thank you to the Director Fausto for uh, Fausto, sorry, for uh, bringing Encore um, for the way that you. Um, brought it forth the way that you shared it with the public, the way that you got engagement from teachers. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to um, Ms. Uh, Raman and Ms. Murta for your devotion to uh, our students and the love and the care um, and the way that you share that with our students. It's incredibly valuable. Um, I feel very comfortable with the fact that it's endorsed by a parent uh, of an exceptional student. And so I, uh, I just want to say thank you. I, I did review this, and I, and I think it's, inc it's incredibly helpful as it relates to life skills. Um, I love the fact that they're going to learn you know, how, to, how to do an ATM machine. I mean, we, we could all learn how to use a, a credit card and how to check out at the grocery store and that kind of stuff. I, I, I feel very comfortable and very happy that it's both um, you know, academically stimulating, but also provides very tangible life skills. And so I, um, you know, kudos for, uh, for asking, for bringing forth the Encore pro uh, curriculum, and I'm really happy to, to see it move forward. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, Trustee Kinnear. My notes aren't particularly organized because I didn't have a chance to see the materials until today, but I did look at the materials and first I assume that not all the materials are there because I saw, yeah, I saw like samples of the materials, which is, which is different than most adoptions. So I was a little surprised by that. Uh, I saw that like the 15 pound work, workbook. My gosh, that's the biggest workbook I, I've ever I've ever seen in my in uh, in in my life. Uh, I tried to look at the manual, et cetera, et cetera. I, I was I looked more at math than I did at uh, at other things. And uh, although uh, in in some of the materials I saw a lot of functional uh, you know life skills, uh, there were. You know, I also saw some of the, the standards-based things. And I know that in these classes, there's a wide variety of, of, of student ability levels, but some of it was worrisome to me. I mean, when we're looking at, uh, um, at, uh, at you know, practicing uh, graphing of absolute equations, uh, you know, I, I get, and I got a little nervous, is, is this practical enough? for what many of our, our, our students need. I trust your judgment that you can adapt to that. And I assume that that's what you meant by uh, saying that it might not be fully accessible. Is that, is that, what, you, is that what you meant? Yes, so for example, I have students in my classroom, in my um, elementary classroom, who are nonverbal. A lot of the work right now, they need a lot of physical prompting. So in those types of situations, yes, but we do try our best to make it as accessible as possible. It is going to take some work on our part as teachers to try to make it as accessible as possible for those well, kiddos. I hope that we give you the support that you need in order to, uh, to make it 
more fully accessible because I, I saw some real challenges uh, with some of the standards based when I know that many of our, our, uh, our kids uh, need to, 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 to have functional skills like the credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, if, if you need other things, you, you need to make sure that you, you let district staff know that. Thank I have you. one worry, and here's my worry. Okay. We're approving five years worth of materials. And the last time we adopted materials was 10 years ago. Yes. That scares me uh, that, that we're, uh, I, mean, I mean, I know how money goes. Uh, it scares me that we're only adopting five years when, uh, when the last time we looked at this was, was 10 years ago. So how, how, do, how do we account for that? Great question, thank you. So yes, thinking back to 10 years ago, we only had three sets of materials to consider. This is a new kind of foray for publishers to be getting into providing materials for our students with exceptional needs. We're very excited now that there are seven. One of the reasons that we've recommended five years is so that we don't wait that 10 years. We have the opportunity in five years to be able to reevaluate if there is something that is going to meet the challenges that we're experiencing. However, we have that opportunity to extend what we currently have in the adoption and contract beyond the five years. So we don't need to come back and re-go through this process again. If it's meeting our needs, then at that five years we can extend, or if we'd like to look and see, and we're hearing that there are more materials that are updated and continue to meet the varying abilities of all of our students, we can consider that at that time. I like your response, but it's still, funds still worry me. I mean, that, that, that we might not have the dollars to, uh, to commit five years from now, but uh, I, I, I like your answer. Nice, nice work, you guys. Yeah. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, we'll turn to Trustee Hunt. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Ms. Rosto, and, and also your, Rosto, I'm sorry, Ms. Sugden, Ms. Raman, and Ms. Murtaugh, appreciate your involvement and leadership on this. Thank you, Mrs. Ricks, for being here. It's very important that we hear from parents on curriculum, uh, and I want to commend you that you involve the parents group of, of students of exceptional needs. I, echoing my, my colleague to my rights comments, I love the real life uh, lessons. I, you know, again, CVS, shop CVS, they're our best partner and wonderful people. Just, uh, just for my understanding and, uh, I recently, I guess I'm going through my eighth grade reading list because I reread Huckleberry Finn and then I recently read Jack London's Call of the Wild. So this adaptive, as you say, uh, edition of it, how will it differ than what I read recently when it comes to his novel? So when you open the book, there are three levels. One is there may be a single line of text with a lot of picture, uh, kind of uh, picture clues that match that, those exact words. The next level is more lines of text, but still continuing ha to have those picture clues that really help students to decode that and read that. Then the next level is series lines of text that look more familiar more similar to what you know as a novel maybe three four five six lines of text and no picture clues so that way everyone in the class can engage in that lesson at their level and feel connected to the content who thank you uh, who is determining each child's level if there's three you know tommy you're here and bobby you're here i mean what how does that determine and and how does that young person stay on track? In special education, we do a number of assessments, both formal and informal, of students' progress. So teachers do an excellent job of keeping track of students' progress towards, as Mrs. Murtaugh said, the goals, and making sure that they're aligning those materials to the student needs and to those goals so they can continue to progress. And they continue to, I mean, I, I might be starting on, or on the one modular, but she or he or she might see that I can, okay, so I can transition up and, and go from there. Exactly, and I don't need to trade in my book. That's all within that same text as everyone else. As well, the, that 15 pound workbook has the pages for all of those levels 
in that book so that students, that level can be met. And we have students with varying abilities in math, that might be my strength. And so I am more approaching to grade level in math, whereas in reading, I might be far below grade level. And so the materials, considering they're in all subject areas in that book, the teachers can then make that transition and the students much more easily. Well, I love, I think it was Mrs. Murtog. Ms. Murtog said, this is going to look more like mainline, mainstream curriculum. And I just think that's so important and, and for the well-being and self-awareness of a young person. Thank you. I'm very supportive of what y'all have done. Even though I do agree with Mr. Kinnear, who's more learned than I am. How does five stretch on the 10? But hopefully we're doing it in five years where you're back with even a more improved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. And I, I, I really want to emphasize, though, that I, to, the impression I got is the five years just gives us more options to it, it, uh, committing $1.5 million is, is not going to be an issue uh, with, with that. Uh, as Trustee Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, yeah, thank you, Ms. Frausto, and your whole team for this uh, thoughtful and thorough process. Um, obviously, we took some time to arrive at this decision. So glad that we found something that's going to work uh, well for our teachers and equip them to to do what they do best and support our kids with exceptional needs. Um, wanted to recognize Ms. Murtaugh since I think it was Ms. Morris at the beginning of the meeting mentioned that, you know, you're the reason why her son goes to school. So that's, that's what the kind of things we like to hear as a, as a school board. Uh, those are the things that are exciting. It's great to hear these presentations and, uh, and discuss policy and decision making, but the actual impact that our, our teachers are making on students is, what we want to hear. So thank you uh, for, for being his reason to show up. And I'm sure that goes the same with for you as well for many of your students. So thank you both for being here this evening and, and being part of this process and making impact on our students. Um, yeah, let's. Um, a couple questions I have. I mean, I'm supportive of this first and foremost, so I will be voting, voting yes. Um, and I, I recognize my, my two colleagues' concerns about you know, the ups and downs of education budgets, but um, <clears throat> I think you, you invest in the things that are, are value and you find the money that, for things that are important. So despite where we are five years from now, um, we're gonna need some kind of a curriculum for, for, for students with special needs, so uh, we'll have to find the money to, to do something for them. Um, as far as... Uh, some of the shortcomings, right? There's no perfect solution for students with varying de degrees of abilities. Um, I'm glad that we're acknowledging that now. And then hopefully because we're acknowledging the shortcomings of this, we have a plan to fill those gaps ahead of time. We don't wait until the school year starts and we're like, oh wait, this doesn't work for these groups of students. Um, we start working on those, those now. And even if it's um, stapling papers together, which I know are not ideal, but whatever it is to, to, to address the needs that, that these, these, this curriculum doesn't uh, address, I hope we do that now. And I know that we have the staff that's capable of doing that. Um, uh, English learners were mentioned in one of the slides, but we don't really talk too much about how this curriculum uh, addresses the needs of some of our English learners. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, and is, is this, is that another shortcoming or does this have uh, the capacity to also address the needs of our students learning, learning our language of English? I'll provide a brief response and then turn it over to um, both of our teachers who really dove in and piloted the materials. But that was one of the guiding principles that was important to the committee that they look at. We know that students who have disabilities and also English learners, that is a, a uh, student group that we really need to pay very particular attention to. So one of the things that they really looked at was the language support, even for students that maybe express language in different ways. As uh, Ms. Raman pointed out, we have students who may not be verbalizing, but they have uh, picture exchange communication systems that they are able to communicate with. So looking at how we are supporting that language acquisition through those many means. And I'll turn it over to one of them to provide an experience. If they're coming up here, could I ask a question on that? Yeah. So is that a best practice? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a teacher by, and I have no experience in special education, but is that a, an effective best practice to help move our students with, that, that do have, are identified as uh, need, needing extra, special, identified as special education 
um, and also English learners. That's, that's the best practice. Yes, and we have engaged in with uh, trainings and across the state in partnership with our curriculum and instruction team with learning about, there is a, a whole uh, guidance document on how we can support students who are identified as English learners and identified as having some kind of disability as well. So we engage in those conversations a lot from how students are identified for special education so that we are not misidentifying students that are really just needing more time to acquire language and it's not really a disability to how we provide those supports when they are identified from everywhere from the general education class to a class that's supporting students that may not have as many verbal skills and are looking at more of a functional life skills curriculum. Okay. I'm going to give an example. I think that's how, what I'm doing. How the um, how, yeah. So in in my class, I have a student who has an ASL interpreter. Um, many of many, four to five of my students have um, assistive technology, like an iPad, where you touch a, a button and it speaks for you, hmm. th which they use with varying degrees of uh, proficiency. Um, so language is a constant instructional issue in in our class there's i i think we tested seven el students I, we do a rotation program on our site and so i i have 30 kids there's 15 on my caseload but we rotate them through so in our program i think we um did the lpac test on seven so everything we do is language. That's why I liked this curriculum, because the, the ELA component was very strong. Um, I love teaching phonics to my students. They, a lot of them pick up on it quickly, some of them not so much, but the ones who do can really advance and move forward. So this, it just, it covers everything. Like I said, the, dis, the difference in the abilities in our class are so different. That's helpful. Thank you. Again, thanks, thanks for everyone for being here this evening, and thanks for the work, and um, look forward to getting these materials in the hands of our, our teachers for, is it next, next year? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lee, and uh, thank you to all my colleagues for some very thoughtful uh, deliberation and perspectives. I, I would just really echo the process aspect. I, I think when you have uh, such a good comprehensive effort and, and it's ex inclusive, and you have the right people at the table, uh, that, is, that produces the kind of outcomes we want. So we really want to commend that. I really want to extend this particular appreciation to both the teachers, Ms. Rahman and uh, Ms. Murtagh, uh, for for your patience. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's a little bit late now in the meeting, but um, thank you so much. And uh, your, both of your reputation precedes you, uh, and we're so grateful uh, to, to have people of your caliber, not just uh, for our students, but for you to take the time and share those thoughts with us is really the highlight. And always appreciate the perspective of, of uh, great uh, parent advocates like Ms. Risk as well. So thank you all. Uh, we can now uh, entertain a motion to, <laughs> to approve uh, a motion by Trustee Lee. Second. Second, Trustee Hunt. Please vote. Okay, the Thank motion you. carries unanimously. Thank you all. Okay, our next agenda item is uh, one that the board looks forward to, and that's the adopting resolution uh, 2022 slash 2023 72 uh, regarding classified school employees week, May 15th through 19th. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Ibarra to lead us through this, this agenda item. Thank you, I was apologize, telling them thank you for their work. So good evening again, Dr. Farouk, uh, Superintendent Hill and members of the board tonight. I bring to you two routine items, but they're both very exciting items. You heard a little bit about them uh, earlier from our association members, but we ask for this first one. It is recommended that the Board of Education adopt resolution 2022-2372, recognizing classified school employee week on May 15th through the 19th for 2023. 
Thank you, Ms. Ibarra. So I'll turn now to trust, uh, our clerk, our, our clerk, uh, Trustee Hunt. Do we have any public comments? Okay. Uh, we can either have comments or questions or entertain a motion. Motion by Trustee Hunt. Second. Second by Trustee Kinnear. Please vote. And the motion carries unanimously. Uh, our last action item on the agenda tonight is another one that's important to all of us on the board. That's adopting uh, resolution 2022-2023-71, recognizing California Day of the Teacher on May 10th. Ms. Ibarra. Yes, thank you again. So this is, again, Ms. Bowling kind of gave away the, the big news, but it is the recommendation that to the board that we adopt resolution 2022-2023-71, recognizing California Day of the Teacher on May 10th for 2023. Thank you, Ms. Ibarra. We're very grateful for all of our 4,000 plus employees uh, in, in um, both capacities. No public comments, uh, from Clerk uh, Hunt, we can entertain a motion or questions. Motion by second. Trustee Lee, second by Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Please vote. And the motion carries unanimously. So this takes us to our uh, reports discussion portion of the agenda, which is an update on the A through G completion grant. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jamie Angulo. Welcome, Dr. Angulo. Thank you. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and members of the board. So I am excited to provide an update on the progress of our A through G improvement grant plan. So last year, the state allocated funds to all districts in the state with the purpose of providing additional support, uh, additional support to school districts to increase A through G readiness uh, for students who graduate. The plan was presented and approved by the board in, in April of 22. The purpose of tonight's presentation is just to report on those action items that have been completed so far this year. And this visual capture, captures our board priorities and how it aligns with our report this evening. The A through G improvement plan aligns to the priorities of student learning, A through G completion, and our ongoing work of preparing students to be college career and world ready. The 3.6 million in funds are specifically allocated to improve A through G eligibility, and it is through June of 2026. And this slide is a reminder of what A through G is. Um, there are 15 required courses for acceptance into the CSU UCs. The A, the A through G aligns to the subject areas that you see listed on the slide. They are minimum requirements. Some areas recommend more. For example, you can see in science there, uh, line D, uh, the recommendation or the requirement is to have one year of a lab science in physical science, as well as one year of a lab science in the biological science, but the recommendation is to have at least another year. Here we have the A through G uh, data for the last 11 years. Uh, last year we were at 52.3% district-wide. Uh, we did see a slight dip from 2021. And the overall actions for the grant include the six categories that are listed on the slide. And I'm actually going to go into detail on each one of those categories in the upcoming slides. So starting with the A through G awareness campaign. The campaign includes elementary, middle, and high school, and is led by the high school principals, uh, working with their cluster of schools, which includes all of their feeder schools. Uh, the goal is to make A through G a part of the culture and expectations for students starting in TK. Uh, the plan includes culture building, early understanding of A through G, importance of a rigorous course of study, and just what it means to be college and career ready. And part of the campaign incl it includes just one small component of it is uh, A through G gear. And I just want to show you some examples of what has already been started. So you will start to see as you go across campuses, elementary, middle, and high schools. High schools have been doing this for a while. You'll see, a, you know, you'll see posters that show A through G awareness in every classroom. Um, 
So the Ramona one, you'll see uh, Ramona Sierra and all of the elementary school logos, and you'll start to see those being produced in uh, every school showing their cluster. This one happens to be for Riverside Virtual School. They just produced this and all of their teachers will have it in the background and when they're uh, teaching is just one of the pieces that are there. And again, all levels. So that's just one example. Um, a, couple, a couple of things, and you actually have a bag of some of these goodies. Um, we just kind of randomly pick some up. This is Lincoln High School. It says Lincoln High A through G, little cap, a pen. Um, this one uh, shows Rain Cross Summit View A through G opportunities, and it just mentions this, and the staff will have that. This one is for staff at Poly High School, where it says, ask me about A through G, and it lists the A through G in each one of the content, not just uh, core content, but all of the teachers. So if you're a science teacher, you actually are gonna have A through G, but you have the science uh, that this class is gonna represent the science component of it. And just, again, building that awareness, and they'll wear this on uh, different days throughout uh, the year bookmarkers that are going to be out to kids that talk about A through G. So there's just a variety of different things that they're putting out there. Um, and there's more in the, the bag. I could go on and show you more like magnets, things like that. So this just started um, this year. The, the teams are really excited about it, the elementary schools, and really just working as a cluster to see how do they promote this awareness. So let's see. The next bucket item, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one, uh, it's transcript analysis. And, and, you know, we do transcript analysis for individual students and system-wide. And we look at, um, to determine individual, uh, where students individually can improve, but also system-wide where there might be some barriers and what we need to do to remove those barriers. It can tell us uh, if students are struggling with access or success, meaning that a student doesn't have access, isn't able to take the course for whatever reason, or maybe they are and they're not successful in it. So it's two different things that we're looking for in the transcript analysis. Um, we also, we do transcript analysis for, like I said, a variety of different lenses that we look through. We are, we have completed transcript analysis in middle schools, which is fairly new. We, that is not something we have typically done, but we look for uh, high school readiness uh, when we do middle school analysis. And each of the sites participated in that. And I'm gonna give you some examples of what we, we found. Um, one site found that special ed courses had a disproportionate number of failing students. So the administration provided professional development on scaffolding strategies to special edu education teachers so that we can have success for the students in the courses. The focus shifted to um, like mastery versus compliance. Another middle school rep reported that they identified African-American students were disproportionately failing science. The counselors did a focus group with students who had failed the course to hear their reasons or their perspective of the course and what that, uh, why they believe they failed. And then that information was taken back to the teachers. The MTSS liaisons worked with the teachers on the feedback and how we can uh, support students in the classroom. Another middle school uh, took the high school readiness report and created that into their school plan goals and how they can improve. It, improve. Another uh, piece that we take from our data, and this is another middle school example, when we were going through, we realized that some sites were using different course codes for how, so it could be for ELA, just different course codes that weren't aligning with CalPads. And so for us, it was a, a way to do some data cleanup. So it, it, it told us a lot of information that in, is just middle school. 11th grade, we do uh, the analysis in the spring to make sure that we identify students that really we really need to target for to take summer so we can personally invite those students to go to summer school to let them know to make sure they're ready for graduation. We also do another round uh, right after summer school is done in July for our uh, seniors that took summer school. So then uh, we use a different filtering approach. We actually partner with the county on this where we look at every senior with the courses that they've taken and we can see if they've done if they had two, three course adjustments, so it's on a spreadsheet, you know, if this student, if we're able to alter two or three courses, that student would then be A through G ready. So we make note of that, so when we can make those course changes, uh, we can do that right now in the system so that student walks in starting that senior year with uh, on the path to be A through G. 
And then, and this prompts a lot of conversations with counselors to do that. So we do that work ahead of time before the, the counselors come in. Counselors are a part of this work that want to do this, but that's done right after um, summer school. So these are just some of the, the things that we've done with transcript analysis. We have been partnering with the County Office of Ed to assist us uh, because of the programming they, they use with uh, some of the transcript analysis. However, we have excellent programmers in the district, so we've invited them to be a part of our transcript analysis, and they have done such a fantastic job. They've duplicated the process, so we, we um, are about 95% done, and we'll be able to do all of that work in-house uh, this fall. Our ninth and 10th grade have a, a variety of program monitoring, which includes academic plans, screener identification, and so on. All right, academic planning. So all students will have a four, um, have a four year plan in ARIES. It's our student, uh, it's a four year plan in our student information system that students are actively involved in, which gives them a student agency. They can see as they plan the next four years what courses they need to take to, in it to be A through G ready on that. Here's an example of that. And uh, last year this was presented here, but this is an academic plan. And it shows how a student can say this, you know, what's in green they've completed, what they're currently enrolled in, and what they've planned. Parents can see this as they're planning because they're going to make changes. But when they go and make changes, they're not starting from scratch. Or, you know, they're they're modifying the plan. They're looking at it. They can see out on um, the next four years. Additionally, uh, middle school is. Um, also working on, sorry, I'm going to go back here. Uh, middle school is also doing the, the plan as well, but it's not a six-year plan. They're working on the two-year plan with the students for their incoming seventh grade and eighth grade. So by the time they get to high school, they've already seen this plan, they've already worked on this plan, and then they work on their four-year plan for that. Okay, moving on to the grading initiative. So this year we started our first pilot of the grading philosophy at the secondary level. We had a first cohort of 28 teachers that started first semester. Another cohort, that's uh, 14 teachers that began second semester. And we're currently recruiting for the 23-24. We intentionally were small in the cohort to really get feedback to know where we needed to make those adjustments uh, from the teacher, just hearing from teachers and students. And so the, the grading philosophy, through the grading philosophy, our goal is to make sure that students know the content and skills specified in the standards and that the grade is a clear and accurate representation of their mastery. Not necessarily just the things they've turned in, but really their mastery, not the extra credit, not uh, non-academic behaviors such as, um, you know, tardiness and those type of things. So we know that grading for mastery with clear guidelines and expectations provide consistency and clarity on what grades mean. And so we, we worked with the county office to gather feedback, to get independent feedback from our teachers and students. Um, one student, I'm quoting, said, being able to have a second chance at something you didn't understand at first is a relieving feeling. One teacher said, one success I'm seeing is that students are not asking me how to get more points, but are asking for teacher help on understanding a particular concept, skill, etc. Student anxiety about grades are dropping and engagement is increasing. Um, we also heard challenges too. It's not just all uh, wonderful. Um, some of the feedback we've heard from teachers is that um, because it is heavy on standards-based grading, we really need to, they needed more rubrics on standards-based uh, grading and mastery. And so that's a lot of the feedback that we've seen. So we need to provide that support and, and give them rubrics in the different content areas because we have them across the board. So in ALA and math. And, and so that's what we've heard from teachers. It would really be beneficial to work on that. So we do have a plan moving forward to help provide that support. A through G course, review and update. So as we completed uh, transcript analysis, um, we might find, or we have found, that uh, courses and course pathways that need to be updated or training that needs to be provided, um, such as at a particular site or even across district-wide. Uh, so one thing we did find is that we needed to update our special education math and science courses, and we did that this year. Uh, to provide an accessible pathway for our students with IEPs to be A through G eligible. Uh, our, prior to this year, it was the pathway 
made it very challenging for students with IEPs to be A through G eligible because of the current math and science pathway. So that has been updated. But since we updated the pathways and changed some of the courses, we know we had to provide that training for the teachers the, on not just the the content, because in science we shifted to physics course. Well, we want to make sure the teachers understood the content and the pedagogy in teaching that. So we were able to, sorry, we were able to provide, let me get back one more, um, for teachers, for example, our 15 edu uh, special education math teachers were provided a summer training, two pull out days, two after school opportunities. For our physics, eight special ed science teachers, we offered six after school trainings and those type of uh, supports are coming from this grant. A quote from one of the special education math teachers says, as a new teacher teaching in RUSD teaching math, this PDE provided helpful tools and strategies to implement in the classroom. So guidance technicians is uh, on this slide here. So as part of the plan, we were able to hire guidance technicians. And listed on the slide, you'll, you'll see some supports that the guidance uh, technicians provide counselors and students, uh, such as the technical support on college applications, FAFSA, and college and career online resources, just to provide that technical support. So counselors are able to support more students individually. So that these are a lot of technical pieces that the counselors would do, would do and which take a lot of time that now the technicians are able to do either in group work or even individual where the counselors can do other things. One counselor said that guidance technicians, and I'm quoting, FAFSA support was huge for our seniors. They provided more contact with students and families. The guidance techs were able to get the answers. We school counselors and families needed to complete the application. A principal said, guidance technicians are doing what parents and kids have expressed as a concern in the past that uh, only AVID students get this college support. And now we have the support for the entire school. Uh, so in one piece of data point in this uh, area where a counselor said it was very helpful, the FAFSA and the California Dream Act application completion rate for RUSD as of March 27th was 61%. June 30th of 2022, we were at 55%. So we've already exceeded our last year's end um, uh, total of 55% and March 27th, we we're at 61. So that just, it's an example of some of that support. This is a, a visual of uh, just sh it's a, a pyramid of supports that show how uh, we support all students with the counseling role. Counselors are tier one. All students have access to counselors. Students that need additional support or monitoring will receive additional support. A student might need more one-on-one -on -one time uh, for the applications, as I mentioned, the technical support. That counselor now has the ability to move to tier two because the, the guidance technicians do take over. Uh, are able to provide a lot of that. And so just the keeping with the example of FAFSA, in the past if a parent called and said, I have some questions regarding FAFSA or logging in or just those technical pieces, it would go to a counselor. Those phone calls could be 45 minutes to an hour. It's, it's not an easy process. It's a technical piece. And now those get routed to the guidance technicians to where the counselors um, don't have to spend their time on those calls. But the guidance technician does work with the counselors in the same office. And if, all the time on these type of things. So guidance technician has been trained on uh, the programs um, that we have, the student information system, national clearinghouse data, our uh, college and career pathways, all of the programs we use in guidance, we have been training our guidance technicians on. One site reported, uh, who's logging this in Aries, that uh, their guidance technician has had 480, 418 student contacts as reported by, as logged into Aries. So this slide shows the A through G rate by educational program. Our goals were set with the target of moving towards the closing the, uh, the achievement gap. We set a goal of 2% each year for each of the student groups. We, um, an overall goal of 2% yeah, each year, but to close the gap, it was either gonna be by 50% of the current goal or 3% each year by the time it gets to 2026. Uh, and this goal, these goals were set last year when it was presented, so it was based on 21 data. I did work with a statistician at the time to look at what was 
aggressive but reasonable, what would push us over on the dashboard, and that's how we set those goals uh, for each of the student groups, which could also be applied to um, uh, further the student groups, this is on student programs. So the goal is 61.6% by 2026 with a, two, as I mentioned, 2% increase or higher. Um, each site has their, over, their overall and student group goals because each site would be different. We are on track to meet that with the action plans that we have in place. However, uh, I just want to review some specific challenges that have been reported. Uh, Asking sites what their greatest challenges are with regards to A through G completion is very different across the sites. Uh, one site said it was special education, math, and science completion. Another, uh, multiple sites said it was D and F rates, but what they reported was one site, world languages is the highest barrier. Another site said it was math one. One site uh, said that a, gr a huge barrier is um, family and student belief that A through G is not needed and not wanting to take those courses. Senior English was reported at another site. So um, also uh, just providing services to our English learners um, that uh, just providing services to English learners that even though we might have newcomers that are ready and uh, academically prepared and will be A through G, we do have quite a few that aren't and sites reported that it was difficult to provide those services needed to get them to be A through G ready. And so these are challenges that are reported by the sites. Uh, we do monitor A through G completion through a variety of ways, not just the end of the year, uh, what the state reports back. We have a number of ways to monitor it. Um, Aries Analytics is one of them. So if I were to pull up a school site in Aries Analytics, it's going to tell me right now that school site where their seniors are at um, according to the analytic programming, which has some challenges, but it does uh, tell us where it's at. We have our academic plan. We have our internal college and career readiness dashboard that students have access to and we have access to, and it provides a little bit of a different lens. Our California Colleges Guidance Initiative, which we have students, uh, which we partner with them. All of our students are in the program, which it has a nice uh, four-year plan with them, and it does color code how, uh, what is A through G and what's not uh, for students and what they need to work on. We, as I mentioned, we do our system-wide analysis. We do review of individual transcripts. We have programs that help support this, heritage and legacy. Uh, so we, we have a number of internal monitoring pieces on our data, not just the end of the year data. So another um, area, and I just wanted to make sure we mentioned it, that uh, math comes up um, frequently as a, as a barrier. Uh, in completing A through G, and as mentioned, that we did restructure our our special education math pathway. We've created um, uh, structured math one for special education and math two for special education. What I mean by structured, it's it's just that it's a highly structured, but core material. It is core material. Uh, it's just a highly structured delivery plan of that. So um, all of those high yield strategies are. Uh, already set up ready for the teacher to deliver to be able to allow students to access uh, the curriculum and we have we are developing we have that in special education this year we are developing uh, or planning to move that to general education for our students that are struggling in math one to provide that highly structured math one core level grade level uh, mathematics for students and then the following year we are going to be developing our second level math and then also moving into middle school as a response to the data. We do have uh, uh, quite a, we have third year options that are in lieu of taking math three uh, such as financial algebra and probability and statistics that will meet A through G. That is another option for our students to complete math. Uh, we have numerous fourth year options, but that third year is uh, a key component there. And then, of course, the UCs and CSUs do validate math courses if they complete uh, a second year or even the second semester or the later year that will validate the year before. So we definitely make sure uh, our counselors are in tune with that because we might be able to work with the students to get that A through, A through G completion through validation. 
So the grant has contributed greatly to our, our actions for the goals of increasing A through G. There's been uh, many successes and challenges that I've actually already reviewed some of those. I just wanted to point out a couple because um, some have already been mentioned. Uh, you know, the training, the transcript analysis has been great. Um, one of our challenges was that we really wanted to expand to include a lot more teachers for awareness and understanding. Uh, you know, substitute availability was difficult across the board, so we weren't be able to we weren't able to train as many. But that was uh, definitely a challenge. Um, Guidance technicians, we didn't actually get them all hired and trained, which is extensive training on board, ready to go until November. So we actually haven't had them for very long. Uh, but those are just uh, a few, I want to say expanding to middle and elementary, or as you mentioned, our A through G, or as I mentioned, A through G campaigns going well. We still have a lot more work to do in elementary and middle school. We just kind of got kicked off on that. And so those are just uh, some of the pieces there. And so I uh, definitely want to end on a, you know, on a positive note um, that I think it was mentioned by our student board member that we're in the, we're in the notification season of college acceptances and it's a real exciting time for our students and it's not just for colleges, it's for the military, for the, you know, just knowing the next step is coming. It's a very exciting time for our seniors, regardless of if they're going into college, career, wherever they're headed, but uh, we are hearing about many different scholarships and we just heard UC Merced accepted 61 of our students, UCR reported that 390 of our students were admitted, and we just got that information last week. So it's a lot of exciting things that are happening, and this is just one piece of that whole uh, puzzle there. But uh, I do want to uh, open up to public comments, but I also wanted to mention that Dr. Iacone is here, who uh, works extremely close with our counselor. She is the trainer of our guidance techs, works with our registrars, and has a lot of detailed knowledge on this as well. So we will be happy to answer any questions that you have after public comment. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Angulo. I just want to say that was a very excellent and a very comprehensive, thoughtful report. Really appreciate that. I'll turn to my uh, colleague, uh, our clerk, Trustee Hunt. Uh, Sandy R. would like to speak. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. Great presentation. So um, I, I got to be part of that um, parent um, grading for equity um, program. So I kind of got a lot of the information about that. And there's a lot of that that I support. But one of the things that I have a concern with that I've said before is I want to see the follow through. So that was a great presentation, had a lot of information. But I think that we have to look at all the pieces of the puzzle. So we need to look at the A through G preparedness, but we need to look at... Sorry, um, I apologize. The timer hasn't been moving. Uh, the that's okay. I probably won't use the full three minutes. That's fine. But um, I just wanted to say that, you know, we need to look at all aspects. So we need to look at the A through G um, completion. We need to look at the... Um, oh, my gosh. The word is... They're... they're um, know whether they're uh, proficient. They're profi we want to see if they're proficient in terms of the state testing along with the A through G and along with the graduation. Because to me, your numbers are all over the place. Like you have a really low proficiency, you're middle of the road for A through G, and then you're really high for graduation. So I think that as parents, we need to understand where's that disconnect. How do these numbers correlate? Why is our proficiency so low on testing versus, you know, are we just graduating the kids? Are we making sure that the kids, when they actually get to these universities, that they're prepared? You know, are we following up with these universities and saying, what's, what's the completion rate of our students? So you accepted 300 of our students. How many of them graduated? How many of them were prepared? Because I think that's the real important thing. We don't just want to say, OK, yeah, we graduated this kid. He went to this college. He got in debt, and he didn't finish. We, you know, we have a responsibility to make sure the kids are prepared. And I just think. Parents need to see this information. Parents need to know this. How are you sharing this with parents? You know, I know when, when my kid got his schedule, I looked at it and I called his guidance counselor and said, nope, get him out of that class, put him into this class. And, you know, I discussed with my son why we made that decision. But are parents really looking at these? Are parents having any kind of input on the actual schedules and the choices the kids are making? This would be a great presentation to maybe do to some of the parent groups so that they're aware as well. because. Parents will support you on this. They all want their kids to be prepared. And I think if you have parents buying in, teachers buying in, you, it's a win-win. So thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. R. I will now turn to board member comments, starting with Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. <laughs> Dr. Angulo, I want to say thank you so much for breaking this down. I'm so happy to see that there is a full court campaign going on about A through G. I am going to put this on our fridge. Um, I was ha so I sat down with my my uh, daughter's guidance counselor this week as we were. It's time to pick the courses. Um, she was very aware of A through G expectations, which I was happy to see. I was embarrassed that I wasn't fully aware of exactly what was necessary. And it wasn't until I started looking in, I started seeing the color coded and I started to look into Aries and sure enough, like I, I went into Aries and it, here it is. And it's, I love how there's a legend with class, the colors of what's been taken, what needs to be taken, a path forward. I think it's incredibly critical that, I mean, this is what this campaign is for. So I'm just giving kudos of parent, uh, involvement, parent awareness of what A through G is and why it's important. And you said, you said one of you, there's a lot of reasons why it's important, but you said something that really stood out to me is that students are able to see and able to track um, when students have a framework and have a pathway to college, let's say, um, it's attainable. It becomes attainable. It becomes like bite sizes that they can actually digest and and move on to the next. And when they see that they've completed something in ninth grade, and they see what's, ha what's necessary in 10th grade and then in 11th grade, it creates this pa a pathway for them that they can complete. And, and I think that this is a really great strategy for um, seeing, those, seeing success to college. Um, and then obviously um, helping them succeed in college. But thank you for that. I just wanted to say kudos because it, um, I've learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, Trustee Hunt. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Thank you for, for your presentation, Dr. Angola. Uh, just two things. One, please tell me this, the funding does include support for our legacy, our award-winning heritage and legacy programs? We do have uh, support. We do have El Cap line items. We have support for that program, but we do incorporate legacy and heritage students in our uh, in the transcript analysis, all of those pieces that are done include heritage and legacy students Very as good. well. Very good. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put my fellow board member, Briscoe, on the spot because you happen to be the only student up here. But tell me this. If, if you were a freshman coming in and uh, from Shamawa, I would think, uh, and you saw the advertisement and the things that Dr. Angulo, and don't worry about her, she's a strong person, she can take criticism. But if you saw these, are you enthused about it? And, and would, do you believe your young peers entering the ninth grade will be motivated by this and be interested to learn more about this? Thank you. Um, I would say yes. So I know that for me personally, and I know a lot of people in our district, our first generation students, our part of minority groups might not have had, their parents might not have had the same education as they're getting currently. And so I know personally from my experience going into high school, I, I already was pretty motivated, but I, I actually did not know how. And I did not join AVID my freshman year. Uh, I wasn't in it my sophomore year. I did not know what was needed to even apply to a UC, to apply to a Cal State. And having it laid out in this format, I think is extremely beneficial. And I think that fresh, incoming freshmen will also be, um, they would also benefit from this. Considering even if you hypothetically don't wanna go to college, not interested, if you completed these, cause usually by your junior year, you have pretty much everything done. Um, and you change your mind, you're able to apply. You know what I mean? And so I, I really don't see any issues with it, and I think, I think it benefits a lot of students. That, thank you, I, I think that's a great point. If, but I, and I believe even further, if you're not interested in going to college, or more likely it's very difficult for you to take on the estimated $550,000 it's gonna cost you over four years with lost income not working, um, still going to a, an employer being armed with these courses, which is going to hone a student to be even a sharper tool in the job market, 
and being able to point out and helping them understand, look, it's okay, Tom, if you don't want to go to college, make sure that your employer, when you go in to meet with them and you're telling them that you pass these, that, that's, that would be impressive to me if I was head of, you know, ACME tools or whatever. I mean, I think it's, and we ought to get that across to them too. This is good, not just if you want to go to college or you have a chance to go back, which is a great point, um, but it is good in the career market to let prospective employers, et cetera, know I passed the most rigorous courses there are. This, these courses get me into a UC and you need to hire me. So, th and thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Hunt, Trustee Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, thank you, Dr. Angulo and uh, your team for, for this. Good report, good update on what's going on with A through G. Um, glad we highlighted some of the things that seem to be, uh, we've done well in the past, highlighting the things that seem to be working that we've implemented, but still recognizing um, some of the challenges that we're facing and need to figure out a way to address. Um, and because I don't always get a chance to uh, recognize or, or compliment our speaker, Ms. R., but I completely agree with her comments tonight. Um, so I want to give her, give her, give her that, right? So um, I think it is, it's something that I think we've all noticed, right? That, you know, I think we have an extraordinary district. I think we do things really well here, but it is a little bit hard to explain how we just do a good job graduating students, um, do a, you know, above average job getting kids A through G. Um, where is that? But are they proficient, right? We have these standards that are difficult. So why isn't there an alignment? I'm sure there's good reasons for it. Um, but to be able to communicate that out to our parents uh, and to our community, I think is really important. So um, if we haven't already shared this presentation uh, or an update on, on A through G with our parent groups, I mean, I think they can be our best advocates to help disseminate this information um, out uh, to help get them on board with our, our campaign. Uh, I think it's one thing to bring our students on board so that they understand. So Lauren knows when she comes to Ramona that she has to complete these courses and that if she doesn't know how to do it, maybe Avid's the way to do it. Uh, if not seeking out a uh, counselor that can help her get on. on the Luckily, she, she's a quick learner and she figured it out um, despite not being in those courses. Um, Especially if we're starting to push this message, which I think is a great idea, down into the middle school um, so that it just becomes part of your DNA as a student. Uh, and again, whether you're going to college or not, it definitely can't hurt you to take these courses. If anything, it's going to prepare you no matter what it is you decide to do after you graduate uh, from RUSD. Um, so I'm on board with that. I do have some questions. Um, I think Aries, uh, that was brought up, I think, by a, a speaker today about Aries and just the consistency. I, I don't have a high schooler yet, so I'm not sure how consistent um, uh, schools are, teachers are. I realize it's extra work to put that in. Um, but I know my middle schooler, uh, his school site uses Aries, and I've mentioned it before in these meetings. It is the game changer for me. I can look in there anytime, and I know it's not a surprise when he gets his report card. Right? I'm never surprised. I know exactly what to expect every quarter or semester when, when his report card comes. So then I can prepare him. So you know, I'll check probably once a week, like, well, okay, good, good, A, B, A, B, A, A, zero. What's that, right? So get home, son, what's this zero? Oh, I forgot to turn it in. Mm -hmm. It's in my backpack. I did it. Right, so it, it allows me to be connected to what he's doing in the school day, because I don't know about all of you parents with kids, but if I ask my kid how school was, fine, right? Did you have any homework today? Yes, did you do it? Yes, can I see it? <sighs> right? So it's a challenge to try to get information, at least specific. So being able to use tools like Aries, uh, I like the tool for the four-year plan making sure parents know how to access that, guardians know how to access that, and teaching them um, through our, our, our groups, our LCAP meetings, open house, back to school night, whatever it is, uh, I think could be really beneficial. Because if we can have parents as our accountability partners for their students and we teach them how to be uh, good accountability partners, I think we're gonna have uh, good success. Uh, so the more we can use those, those systems, I think um, the better. Uh, 
The other question, and it's not directly related to this report, but it is related to um, A through G in general, is we have so much data on how kids are doing um, in their courses. Have we identified any patterns where if a kid struggles with math, math one, then they struggle with, say, chemistry. But if they um, struggle, but at the same time, those kids that struggle with math one do really well in biology or environmental science so that we can target those kids to set them up for success? Do we, do we go that deep in our analysis? We do go deep in the analysis and really, uh, it becomes very site specific and, um, and it becomes site specific because sometimes there's, as I mentioned, maybe grading practices in a department or uh, just differences across the school site. So in some cases you could take math one uh, and not do well, but do perfectly fine in biology um, because it's not so math heavy, or, but you probably wouldn't do very well in chemistry as you go through that. So there's there's certain logical things that you would see, but sometimes you'll you'll find that it's uh, like site specific. I think I mentioned one site, their highest DNF rate is in world languages. It's not in a math based program. So it's working with what, trying to work with the teachers. How do you, what, what are the obstacles that you're seeing? How can I support the teachers and the students to make sure they can be successful? So it really becomes site specific. Overall, district wide, we definitely see a trend in math. Um, which is why we started, uh, we're really looking at what we can do differently in math and uh, try to support the students that really need it, need it, whether it's due to COVID or just being uh, struggling in math overall. So we do see some, but again, it's it can be site specific. Um, a follow-up question. So along that same line, so if, if we're recognizing these patterns, especially with math, um, obviously the student didn't just start struggling with math when they got to high school. So um, what kind of changes are we making in middle school or elementary school? So we're trying to better prepare those students when they when they get to math one that they're they're successful so uh, math one the the structure component started in general at, or in special education this year uh, very similar to how we have a, a structured ela we started in special education got feedback and and did that so that is we are moving it to gen ed for math one at the high schools next year we are going to be preparing uh, and working on the curriculum for math seven and math eight and math two. Uh, but it's, that's a heavy lift. And so that's the, our focus for next year to be able to do that. Because when we talk about what that looks like, it is, um, it, it's core material, it is core standards, but it is the method of teaching and delivery using those high yield strategies, very highly structured and scaffolded, meaning that, you know, not every student needs a highly scaffolded type of instruction, but if we've identified students that need that, those type of scaffolds will be provided to the teachers so they'll be able to kind of just go with that and not have to create it and it look different in different classrooms. So that is the work of next year for middle school. We are still going to continue with our training so it's not like next year doesn't count. We still support our math teachers, our special education teachers. We'll provide the PD. We work with our course leads. All of that work will still continue but that is one of the things that we are working on intentionally next year. Okay, thank you. A um, couple more questions. You mentioned um, that like grade validation um, and kind of the, the pilot program that we're doing. Uh, I know during the pandemic, so, so, sorry, so, so, sorry, let me back up. So what courses are we doing grade validation for? So we don't do technical grade validation in our grading system. The CSUs and the UCs validate uh, math and world languages. So uh, you sec math two is going to validate math one, or second semester will validate uh, math one. So that is done by the UCs. So you, uh, as they do their acceptance, they have their processes saying, well, you know what? You may have failed math one, but you did math two. We're giving you credit. We as as a system, we don't go in and issue the credit here. So we don't do the validation for credit purposes here. But if we know a student got a D and a C, I, as a counselor, I'm not going to have that student repeat math one uh, because I know that it would be validated unless the student wants to, the family wants to, but it doesn't need to be for A through G purposes. And it's, it's leveraging that because it could be that the student did know the standards, does know the concept, it got the D for a different reason. And so it's just recognizing that and uh, in making sure we leverage the validation option. So a student who got, let's say, a D in math one, but then took math two and got a, a B, um, they would be part of uh, 
A through G, yes. the, part, the successful A through G completion rate. That's correct. All right. And, um, okay, that's helpful. Um, and I think the last thing I noticed but uh, is just the, the graph about the, over the years, uh, how we've, uh, what our A through G completion rate is. And we kind of plateaued since 2017. So even like pre-pandemic, yeah. we haven't made much, much progress. Um, and then we have some pretty ambitious goals, uh, even though honestly, I wish they were more ambitious, but I get it, we gotta be, yeah. we gotta be realistic. Um, why do we think that like since 2017 to even pre-pandemic, we had not much growth? So I, I do think we have to uh, address the, the concerns that have been reported by the principals and that have come out of the transcript analysis because until we, and we're really being aggressive about those transcript analysis and we, we have not in the past, we've done them. Like counselors always do them, so that's, but they don't necessarily look system-wide, they look individual. And so as a system, when we do that for the whole school, and usually it's counselors, we try to get as many teachers in there just to kind of see, you really do see patterns at that school. It becomes very evident. And then that allows um, that teacher or that principal to say, you know, okay, now I need to, clearly our students are struggling in, you know, chemistry or biology or world languages, that we take a proactive approach and see what we need to do to support students and, and or support the teachers. And you really have to go after those you have to know where your, your roadblocks are to be able to address it. And I think we're really, I, I can't say that we we were very aggressive about transcript analysis as a system then. I mean, just what I mentioned with middle school, we have not, I think we did a middle school transcript analysis once prior to the pandemic. It was more to help them understand. We did it again this year. Every school identified something that was a roadblock for them. Every one of them said like, oh my gosh, and was able to then take action on that. Um, and so I think those type of things have to be very intentional and uh, actionable. And then some of the things a school site can't address, it really is up to the district to address, such as the special education math and science pathways. It wasn't for the school to address, it was for district-wide. We had to fix the, the system in that sense, so. Thank you. Uh, last question, I'll turn over to somebody else. Um, specifically regarding our, our English learners, um, I mean, they're struggling with A through G completion rate. So specifically, what kind of supports are we gonna have in place to try to realize a 15% you know, gain over the next four years? So it, we, we have to look at the individual students as they, uh, you know, depending on their, their, when they, were they here at ninth grade, what they have when they're coming in. So it, every counselor is gonna look at to the lens that we're going to get the student A through G qualified. Like we're going to get the student to where they want to be with their goals. At some point, you have to look at maybe you know, they fail too many classes or you know don't have enough credits that you really have to say, okay, right now I, my goal is to get the student a diploma. That you kind of have to shift, okay, now I'm going to go in this direction here. It is always the goal of getting our students A through G, but you have to look then at what point. We don't, we don't want them to be non-A through G and a non-graduate either. So we have to look at that and, and do that. So the, the counselors really do, uh, they work with the, if they can get a student A through G, they, they will, or put the students in there. But we might have scenarios where we just, we really have to focus on other courses and get the student where they need to be to then, you know, then do a handoff to RCC or wherever it might be to do that. So. It will depend on every individual student and uh, where, uh, what they need. And I do think the structured math is uh, going to help with that. But. So um, most of our English learners are starting with us in kindergarten, right? Mm -hmm. A vast, a vast majority. So I get that. We want our students, if, if nothing else, to to get a diploma so they then go out into the workforce at, at the least. But to me, that's like the that's like the floor, right? So. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, are we trying to target, I mean, if we have these specific groups that are disproportionately um, underperforming compared to other student groups, it seems like we should be doing something specific that we're not doing. You know, I mean, if we're gonna do transcript analysis for everybody, but we should be doing something more specific for the groups that are, are, are having more, more, more struggles. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so our long-term English learners, because if they've been here since kindergarten yeah. and they're in our high schools, they are long-term English learners. Right. Our legacy program includes all of our long-term English learners. We do 
uh, analysis on those students far more frequently than we do overall on the individual students. We do have our EL contact that works with the students. We have a number of different supports, or additional supports, I should say, for our English learners and then identifying what is needed and what's the next step as we do that. So we do far more progress monitoring with our long-term English learners, as well as um, our English learners that are not long-term. Okay. May I add just a little bit to that, Mr. Lee? Sure. Also, another way that we need to do this is we also need to be utilizing different instructional strategies in the classrooms that target the language needs of our kids. Uh, we've been working towards that over the last few years, um, but I think as we've shared with this board and through your guys' uh, wisdom and support, we have um, now a plan to put more resources into schools to be able to directly support English learners. Uh, starting next year, we're going to be having English learner <clears throat> TOSAs or coaches come in to help support our teachers to increase their knowledge and skills with how to support English learners. We are better utilizing um, interim assessments to give us progress throughout the year on how our uh, English learners are progressing with their language development. We've began a targeted professional development campaign that just started this year with looking at what we call um, integrated English language development, having a set of very strategic, systematic, and simple strategies that are used across the curriculum to help give English learners support. Uh, so those are very intentional efforts that we're doing to change practice, because in changing practice, we'll be able to have more kids be successful and have that positive momentum flywheel as we go forward. And, and I could just add one piece to the English learner portions. We have updated our English learner pathway for students and that started this year. Uh, and that meaning that if we have a student in ELD, they are still gonna be in ELD, but taking their, let's say, intro to lit core class. And so they are, uh, the students would still be in uh, grade level, the core class, with um, no more than 50% of the students being English learners, and that is uh, what research supports and is actually required. And we're training the teachers, so we have English learners and non-English learners in the class, and those teachers are being trained on those strategies that Dr. Sosa mentioned. Uh, but at no time are you gonna have a student taken out of core. An English learner will have access to core at all times. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, student board member Briscoe. Hi, so I actually wanted to compliment uh, your mapping out. There's so many benefits of mapping out your whole schedule. I know um, specifically for me in high school, it allows you to see all the courses that are available. And I know in the past there's been so much disconnect knowing what courses are available in the actual high school. Um, for example, we have AP Biology, and there's kids that come in as seniors and are like, we had that, you know what I mean? And so I think it really provides a nice platform for students to kind of see what type of options they have. I also know that um, with my counselor, our counselors do a very good job kind of s collaborating with students. I know there was some discussion about students picking the courses and parents getting involved, et cetera. I know at least that um, at my school, there's a lot of collaboration when needed. So I know students initially, especially uh, it's during school, during a specific period where they actually um, map out and pick their courses. And then some teachers may come around and validate it and say, okay, you got what you need to do and go on. Um, but also I know that there's um, some students that need some specific guidance. Um, do you take a college class? Do you take a regular class? Do you take an honors class? And I know that for example, uh, someone who's going to a UC or a Cal State may need that uh, three plus years of math, um, that two plus years of science. I also know that um, I know a lot of, of my counselors that will still validate someone's schedule, even if they're going to a private school and uh, say an A through G course is not something that they need, like they're majoring in musical theater. They, don't, they no longer need that. Um, so I just wanna applaud. But um, anyways, I also have a, a question on Eng for English learners. Um, I know obviously a lot of English learners are coming from out of the country as well and have completely different um, 
grades from different schools. And I actually have ran into a girl where um, she was from out of the country. She took a bunch of classes. She had her PE requirements fulfilled. She had different um, classes fulfilled. But when she came to school um, in RUSD, they would not validate uh, those classes. And so is there something in place to, to combat that? Yes, uh, so when we get students that uh, had a, from another country and many countries have different educational systems and it's, it's hard to be an expert at, at all of that. And so, so for example, someone might say their high school's two years. So we need to recognize that they're what they would call their intermediate would actually be part of high school. And so there's a, we do partner with a, a company and I cannot think of the name, but we do partner with um, a company that is that does have that sort of expertise and actually does translation of a lot of different transcripts and that so we're able to take that because we can't just say it's four years of high school uh, so we're only going to recognize that we have to recognize the system that that uh, that they were in and be able to equate it to what we would have and it is it, it sometimes takes a little bit to do that so I don't know in that particular example of how that uh, where there might have been a miss or maybe according to the company we work with that actually wouldn't have been considered high school and they wouldn't have granted that credit for there. So we definitely do try to explore all options to make sure we give the student the credit that they need. And, and in some cases it does take a little bit to make sure we do that um, and take a little bit of time, especially if it's not as familiar. Like we get a lot from Mexico, and but there's some countries that we, we don't see them very frequently. And so we do have to partner with an outside agency. And, and with seeing that, do you ever see a loss of time? I know in this um, specific situation, it took so long for her courses to get validated that she was missing out on classes that would help her learn English. And she would consistently say, I just want to learn English. I just want to take some English class. I already did my PE and I'm wasting time. So uh, we would have in that particular case, you know, this because we know that the actual official transcript may not come for later, but we do rely on what parents and students tell us and uh, you know, what we have is maybe an unofficial transcript or what we're able to do that. So I don't know in that particular case, but we do want to place the students into the courses to get them to be graduated. But if a student says, I took math one, we wouldn't want to place the student in math one, even though we didn't see it there because they said they took math one and we would wait until we got the final transcript. So. So I don't know in that particular case, but we do really try to honor what the parents and students say until we get that information. And sometimes they'll say, well, I think it was math one, or you know, I think it was ninth grade, or this particular elective. So we try to match what is told to us, but it does, I mean, it, it can take a little, I mean, what, a month, two months? So, I mean, it, it, it could. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Depending on the country, it's a two to three week turnaround for it to come back, and it does come back quite quickly. Um, most of the time, we are having trouble getting the official transcripts. Um, we do have an agreement with AERC for kids that are displaced from the Ukraine because of the war. Um, so they have allowed us to take report cards and unofficial transcripts. So we do work with AERC very closely to make sure that we are meeting each individual kid's needs. We've had probably about 56 come in this year, which is higher than most years. Um, so, and a lot of our kids are coming in at grade 11. Um, we have had some come in at 10, but a lot of them come in at 11 and 12. So it is a little bit more difficult to um, make sure that they meet A through G, but we do our absolute best. And as Dr. Angulo said, we make sure that we place them based on where the parent and the student says that they came from. We don't ever want to overplace them like math three when they need to be in math one or something of that nature. But we do do, a, the counselors do a great job of making sure that they are placed appropriately. Okay, Thanks. thank you. No, thank you, and she brings up a good point. It's sometimes getting that official transcript to then send over adds to that um, timeline in that, but yeah, we do work with the parents. Thank you, a student board member Briscoe, Trustee Kinnear. Thanks, A plus uh, on staff actions. We're doing a ton, you guys are doing a, a ton uh, in a variety of areas, uh, and 
uh, I expect that we'll see uh, success. I hope that, that we'll see success. Uh, my, uh, my concern is, very, is more specific. Uh, you know, my concern is, is, uh, is, you know, how are students learning? How do we know it now? Uh, rather than waiting until, you know, next year uh, sometime, uh, we'll get uh, 2023 20, results just as we just got 2022 20, results. Uh, it, it doesn't do, it, it, it does, it, I don't want to say it doesn't do us any good because it does, uh, but it would do us a, a whole, whole much, it would do us much more if, uh, if we had some results along the way uh, that tells us how we're doing. <laughs> so what evidence do we have now that all this staff work uh, is helping students learn? Uh, that's that's my biggest question. So I'll try to answer that a couple of ways. But when it comes specific to A through G data, uh, yes, the end you know we'll find out come August, September, you know the twenty twenty three. But we do, as mentioned, like I could pull up a school system right now to say where their seniors are right now with A through G completion. And I think, as I mentioned, it's it's not perfect because of. Um, like you, a student could be enrolled in a college right now and they're, it's not gonna take that in. They could have taken the SAT and gotten their world language completed, but that's not gonna be factored in. So there, and then there's also, it's, we're not necessarily factoring in that maybe a student um, failed their second semester, is gonna fail their second semester senior English class. So it's, it's not uh, perfect there, but that it, it is helpful. It is a dipstick, it does tell us. We can um, see overall. Uh, but one of the things that is going to be really helpful, um, and one of the reasons that we did partner with the county, but as I mentioned, we have great programmers that uh, the the program that they're working on, you can pull up by grade level at a school or by student, um, you could pull up where they're at with A through G by percentages, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, because we set the parameters of what that looks like. So at ninth grade, you have to have completed three of the four that year of the 15, you know, we set the parameters and we put it in there and then we can tell you if that kid or how much in that particular grade level where you might have those struggles. So that will be up and running in the fall. But it, it's and the reason why, another reason that's still not perfect is because we may flag a student as not being A through G, but they had a, every intention of doing their world languages their junior year. We just have to make some assumptions that, oh, they're going to complete it by this particular point, but they plan on taking the SAT, and so we might flag them as not being A through G ready when they are. So, so not a perfect system, but we do have um, ways of going in and seeing and monitoring, um, it, you know, as mentioned throughout. So that's the A through G component of it, but when you said, um, how do we know that students are learning? Are you more referring to actual? No, A, a, a oh. through G. I mean, oh, okay. A through G completion means yeah. learning. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think you had it on your first slide, okay. and I'm glad it was there. <laughs> uh, you said, "What's what's the uh, you know? Why do we have this A through G grant?" And you had improved student learning. That's, correct. Um, that, that's what we're that's what we're trying to, to do here. But right now, we don't have a, a system in place to track that data. That will come. That will come next year. So uh, we have uh, we ha we partnered with our uh, with the county for our seniors. We did that same program for our middle school. We uh, worked with our 11th grade. So we did it with certain pieces as we partnered with the county. So it wasn't readily available for a principal to pop up right there. So we did have it, but not as readily accessible as it will be next year because it'll be our internal program. So. We, uh, the programmers, attended the transcript analysis, saw what we needed, uh, worked with Dr. Iaconi on what is the parameter to, for us internally to say that this is a kid that's on track, and then we can then uh, apply that grade level-wise. That's, uh, they're about 95% done, and it's, they're just looking at, you know, pieces to, to polish it up. So it's more readily available. We don't have to wait till our contract time that we partnered with the county. So um, we, so yes and no, we've had it, but not as frequent as we'd like it. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about that because, mm -hmm. I mean, if we if we don't know how our ninth graders are doing in terms of of meeting uh, A through G requirements, then we're going to always be behind the eight ball with uh, with trying to get kids to be uh, A through G eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I I look I look forward to that. Uh, it it would, uh, I mean. And, and there's no perfect system, I know that. I mean, this is student learning. Um, I, don't, 
I don't know a perfect system anywhere uh, with, with, with this, uh, but to have some kind of evidence uh, now about whether or not this year's seniors are gonna meet the goals that we set. Are we gonna improve 2% uh, th th this coming year? What evidence do we have that we are or that we're not uh, besides all the work we're doing? So I, I asked that question to all the principals prior to this, you know, where we at and you know, with your school's data. And the first place they're gonna look is the Aries Analytics. And it, that's where I would pull it up saying, okay, this is where you're at. And then they would be able to then say, and that's for their seniors, but it's not gonna tell me for their ninth graders, their 10th graders, but it is gonna tell me for their seniors. And then they know where their goals are and you can filter it uh, by student group. So they know where their goals are. And they could probably say, well, I'm going to make it because it's, or I'm not going to make it based on what that tells me. Because again, you got to give or take some percentages up or down. And uh, a majority of the sites said yes. One site, you know, said, uh, you know, a little worried, uh, but they were able to identify some barriers that they're going after right now that could fix that. So it's the action plan from knowing that data and then identifying where it might be an issue and what we're putting in place to remedy that before you get to the end of the year. So, and they have that data to say, well, oh my gosh, I, my, our, if it's senior English, what are we doing right now to make sure that those kids don't fail senior English and they're putting in place to save that. So they have that data readily available. They are responding to it. Um, and as I said, the, the transcript analysis told them a lot that they did already put into place, but they, but it's current data when they look at it right now for their seniors as of right now where they're at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation, I would have appreciated uh, having some of that, you know, certainly not school by school. I don't need that kind of, that yes. kind of deal, but, uh, detail, but, but some sense, some evidence that, that all this work that, uh, that, that you're doing uh, is, is, is uh, you know, paying the, the dividend of, uh, in, of in increasing that, that goal. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the piece that, uh, that, that I'm missing. Uh, and Dr. Sosa, you talked about you talked about interim assessments and, and how we can use inter, interim assessments to monitor our student progress. Uh, I haven't seen high school interim assessments, uh, so I don't think we have that. And, um, but I haven't seen interim data with A through G requirements, with meeting A through G requirements, and that again, that's the piece that. That, uh, that, that I'm missing uh, with this great job with all the things we're doing. Uh, we're doing more than ever before, um, but I wanna see the, the results and not have to wait until next springtime uh, to see how 2023 20, students did. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. I have a few things, and I want to reiterate from the beginning that uh, just the, the, you know, the depth, the quality, the scope, the sophistication behind uh, this presentation, uh, not just obviously the format, but just the depth behind it is, is really very impressive. So really want to acknowledge that. Uh, thank you for all your leadership. Uh, so a, a few uh, questions. Um, you know, I noticed there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, there's these challenges that, okay, this is our plan, um, like on slide 17. Uh, these are the areas like, you know, substitute availability and those kinds of things. Then there's aspects around, um, you know, when you're doing transcript analysis, certain patterns and things will emerge that, you know, we need to address. These are the gaps to getting the A through G. I see a lot of those kinds of things. The thing, I know you did allude to this, so I'm not saying you didn't address it at all. The thing I'm curious about is from the student's perspective, why do they feel from their perspective why they're not getting meeting the A through G? Um, I know you did some focus groups on some targeted groups, which, uh, which I think is really good that you did that. But I'm curious, besides the fact of is it, you know, if a class is just too difficult, you know, from their vantage point, they just didn't put or they didn't put in the effort, obviously that creates the outcome, you know, for itself. But how would you answer that? So last year when we were uh, creating the plan, working with principals and counselors, uh, I, I did talk to student groups about A through G, uh, just awareness overall, and it it did come up that they knew it was a poster or they knew information about it, but not so much 
what courses does that mean? What does it look like? What, how does it fit into my plan? You mm -hmm. know, I know I need to have, like, how does the 15 work out? Where does it, where does PE fit into that? Like, it, it, it wasn't, they knew it was there. I mean, she said, do you know A through G? Yeah, you know, but they didn't have intense understanding of it. And there, there was a lack of ownership of the four-year plan on that. And there was also um, hearing the, from students is they, they weren't aware of a lot of the options. Like it was basically, I'm just picking the course for next year. I might have three options, but d d didn't necessarily have the awareness of the broad options of different ways you can meet the math, the third year math, or I could actually take uh, an RCC class. And that does qualify for the A through G um, because that may not be in the presentation that they got in, in English class. So, so that was one thing I did hear um, from students a lot that, and these, these are students that were gonna go to college and you know, it, are gonna be A through G ready, but they, they felt like it, they didn't necessarily have the ownership of that. And, and that was one obstacle, so that kind of led to our A through G com campaign. Another thing that I could definitely speak to as a high school principal, I heard from students, is they didn't, if they've made up their mind they're not going to college, why does it matter? Mm. And that it was a big obstacle. I heard it from a principal uh, saying that that is a big obstacle. I don't need it because I'm not going to college, but I think the message has to be it's, um, it's preparedness. I mean, it is about just being prepared in whatever path you choose. And uh, even, you know, when we say if, if, if this is where your, you know, formal academic education is going to head. Wouldn't you want to be the most prepared? I mean, you would want to be the most prepared because you're, you're now going into the workforce and all of that. So it, it's sending that message that it's, it's not about just if you go into college. And, it, you know, I heard that a lot as a principal that like, that's just not for me, but it, it's reshaping that message. Um, and I'm sure that that is still prevalent. I hear that. Uh, so just making it, doing it early, spreading that word early and making them aware. You know, I'm really glad you mentioned that because instinctively that's what I assumed is kind of like an understated aspect of this is that you know about if, if they they have identified themselves that they're not planning it then why why do it I think one good uh, uh, example maybe to look at is like the FAFSA uh, that was the same thing people were like well, why am I gonna complete a FAFSA if I'm not gonna you know potentially go to college and there was the whole campaign around 100 percent FAFSA completions and everything and how maybe those are some areas where we can learn from uh, and how that can transfer to A2G. But your responses that you just mentioned, I think are spot on, um, uh, you know, being prepared for workforce and everything that the content of the coursework is more broadly applicable. Um, so it's good to know that that's the case, um, but uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, a couple of things that um, I want to express appreciation for also is the early exposure. I think the earlier that uh, the fact that we are going earlier and earlier to this, I think, is obviously going to be going to pay dividends. Um, I'm really optimistic that uh, one, you know, the with the, the time frame of adopting the plan uh, throughout the district uh, and the, how early on they're starting uh, through the K through 12 process. I think th there's really going to be, you know, to Trustee Lee's point earlier about how I was kind of plateauing. I think the culmination of these things is really going to be transformative. I think it can really, this is, it's, it, it takes this kind of an effort to move the needle under these circumstances when you're dealing with such a large bureaucracy and so many factors. Um, my next question is, is what, to, to what extent, how would you characterize parent involvement in all this? Both in terms of uh, awareness and engagement. So I, I, I know that sites do try to be very proactive in uh, doing, you know, parent nights awareness. They might have programs like PK where they're, you know, working with families on specifically, this is A through G, this is information on that. But if it's, it is challenging. I mean, if it's, if we see our kids every day and they have us, they struggle with it. Could you imagine how the one parent night that we have that we're able to go over at that level of understanding that is needed. Um, it, it becomes challenging. It has to be redundant and over. I mean, it, even with, with teachers that teach in high schools every day, I, we have to really go over A through G because they, you know, they have their one course. And so it's, it's not, um, if you don't live in it every day, it's easy to say, okay, what was that? And so I think repetitiveness and that constant, uh, communication, you know, kinder first, this is what it is. This is, oh, this course you're taking, this meets the G. This should be a second level, you know, just that 
as part of the way of the conversation, I think that's where it needs to go. And, and the principals are definitely on board. They are the ones leading the campaign with their cluster. Uh, each one has owned it. It's not me, it is them leading the clusters and determining what works best as their feeder schools and that. So I think there's work, a lot of work actually, to be done with parent engagement on it because it is it's complicated, you know, it's a lot there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really think that it's it's one of those things where if we are not being redundant, if it's seen as like that this is a standalone topic that has to be, you know, brought up once a year, uh, th that's definitely not going to move the needle. So I like the idea of how you're saying, let's just start embedding this and, um, and they, you know, we don't, they don't have to digest the whole scope of all the totality of this in every single encounter, but wherever we can embed it, I think that's, that's very valuable. Um, my next uh, comment is, you know, anecdotally, um, you know, my daughter is not at that point yet, uh, but anecdotally, I hear from so many parents about, you know, uh, the math uh, formats, you know, it's, it's very alien to all of us that did not go through school uh, in math one and math two and all that. Um, what, I know we have, uh, like, the textbooks, there's, like, it's like for parents as well, right? But like, is there, I feel like whatever currently is out there, it's not as helpful from a practical standpoint. Theoretically, is it there? Yes, but from a practical standpoint, parents, I think there's a real interest for them to understand this better so that they can help their kids. How, how would you speak to that? Yes, I, I, I definitely agree. I think that, um, let's say, so every level we have our, elementary uh, math curriculum and there are parent uh, handouts. I, I get them as a parent of elementary school kids, you know, parents that get sent, uh, sent home. We have online resources in middle school and high school, but unless we're intentional about how to use the materials or what to use them for or when would be a good time to access it, because if you have a whole packet of stuff, well, what unit are you on and where do I need to, you know, we, we have to be intentional about saying, okay, so if it is a second grader and, I, and you get that packet, you know, highlighted. We're working on this particular one today. Or just, if if there is a, it's not just sending the packets home. If there is an ask, or if there is a, just an information, just so we're working on this, that we are intentional about that to make sure parents are aware um, on that. And again, constant communication, transparency. This is where we're at. This is what I need students to know. Uh, but as you get to a higher level, it is a little bit more um, intimidating for mm -hmm. parents uh, to to know what, because, but it's not always about being able to help your student at home, it's being able to know where the resources are to direct your students to. Not that I have to help them, but I know where you can get help because I have been given all of the steps, that, you know, I know where you can get help. So it's not the expectation that the parent does that. So, and it's communication. That, that's a very excellent point. Uh, and uh, I hope, you know, we can continue to build on that. Uh, one suggestion, I, I know we've been fortunate to have a good relationship with some of the consul generals, like uh, with Mexico, Guatemala, and so forth. Um, one part of my question is, is re regarding these transcripts, I really appreciate student board member Briscoe's um, uh, personal anecdotal insights uh, of her, because that's, that's exactly the kind of input that's very valuable from us on the dais. Uh, are we potentially, could these consul generals and, and their offices help us expedite getting th these transcripts faster um, or, or us expanding, you know, beyond the countries that we have uh, relationships with? So I, I know we have worked with different consulates on a variety of things, not just transcripts. Um, and so in some cases, it, it is about getting the official one. And uh, you know, uh, Dr. Iacone mentioned it's getting the turnaround two or three weeks is quicker than it used to be, so that's actually uh, good, but getting the official ones were, hard, were difficult. But I know we, we have had good relationships overall with uh, just uh, from working with the Guatemalan consulate on just what type of needs do students have uh, as we started having a large number of students enroll and just really partnering with them on uh, type of supports, not necessarily for the transcript, but type of supports overall. Uh, so I don't know if there's, I mean, I definitely Dr. Iacone and I can talk about if there is a need, uh, if there is an, a particular uh, you know, country or somewhere where we're not getting what we need that we would be able to reach out uh, the group. So she mentioned, you know, the students we got from U Ukraine, how we're able to expedite that and get students uh, just placed and we'll take your, your report card and we're going to, we're going to make this happen for you.
Excellent. Uh, my last comment, and you don't have to answer this more, but just planting a seed, you know, uh, we got a request from uh, Riverside Community College District to do a joint board meeting later this year. Uh, and, you know, just for to think about w beyond what we were already doing, how this could tie in with A through G, um, having a, any kind of innovative partnerships, just to think about um, so that our agenda can be as robust and, you know, productive as possible. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Seriously, you guys did a fantastic job. Really appreciate thank you. You, uh, taking all these questions. Thank you, Dr. Angulo. Thank you. So th that concludes our report section. We're now in the meeting conclusion portion. Uh, so I turn to my colleagues if they would like to request agenda items for future board meetings. Trustee Lee. Uh, I don't know if it needs to be on a future board meeting agenda, but maybe for our workshop that's coming up. I want to talk about board member comments and where they're located on the agenda. Um, I like hearing from all of us board members, but like today, we didn't get started on our meeting till like 7 o'clock. So I know when I first started on the board, those comments were at the end. Um, I think it was during my term for some reasons. We moved them back to the beginning. Um, but I think that would be a good conversation for us to have in terms of where those fall on the agenda and how long we were, were going to dedicate a meeting towards. Sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, Trustee Hunt. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, Pursuant somewhat to, but I'm asking what, to my comments on the legislative me measures and understanding them. I would like to have the staff uh, look at and report um, in the next few three to four meetings at the worst. Uh, AB 278, which is the author is uh, the speaker, Reyes, I believe. And I heard uh, Assembly Member Sabrina Cervantes, who is head of the, uh, the Hispanic, Hispanic Caucus, interviewed on NPR the other day about this bill. It's about dream centers. And what I heard was very impressive. What I'd like to find out more about it is uh, if that's something that would be welcomed by this district, and if so, that we we play a little politics. We offer a resolution in support. We offer for Dr. Farouk, uh, President Farouk, and uh, uh, the superintendent to testify if necessary there. But uh, if, but what we want is if they're going to invest, invest here first. So that is AB 278. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Uh, so that uh, that's noted, uh, and that concludes our future meetings. I uh, now will say, you know, I, we are adjourned this meeting in memory of a very dear uh, community leader and uh, personal friend of mine, our uh, Riverside Fire Captain Tim Strack, who is a very respected member of the Riverside Fire Department, served the community with honor uh, for 28 years. And we also adjourn in memory of Robert and Catherine Porter, parents of Becky Porter at uh, North High School. Uh, Becky's parents were also RUSD staff members for many years. Catherine was an elementary school teacher and Robert was an athletic director and coach at Ramona High School. So we adjourn the meeting at 9.52 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>